Well, welcome, Hearth and Homies, to another compilation of Nick Carter, Master Detective. This show ran on the Mutual Network from 1943 to 1953. And of course, Alon Clark played the title role. Now, we've taken this classic old-time radio detective show, added some beautiful scenery to it, to bring you the OTR Visual Radio, a unique old-time radio viewing experience. Now, just before I tell you to sit back, relax, and enjoy the show, I do need to mention the Johnny Dollar Club. If you've already heard this, or you're already a supporter, that's great. <laughs> But I'm trying to get the word out to as many people as I can, so I need to talk about it for a little bit. As you know, the channel is no longer monetized by YouTube. Now, it's nothing we've done. It's a decision they've made. So we're no longer in the YouTube Partner Program. But that's okay, because we have the Hearth and Home Entertainment Partner Program. We do that through the Johnny Dollar Club. Now, all you need to do is look down in the description below and see the links for Patreon or Buy Me a Coffee. Click on those, and the Johnny Dollar Club starts at only a dollar a month. There's other levels you can choose, but at the very least, we just ask you to consider a dollar a month. Now, if enough people sign up, we can get some real support for the channel and make more compilations and we can stay on the air. And as a thank you, I'm offering access to some exclusive content. That's right, even for a dollar a month. So take a minute, check that out. Another option is if you have a business and you'd like to sponsor a video, this channel gets over a quarter of a million views a month. Sponsorship rates are very reasonable. If you're interested in that, click on our business inquiry email on the about page. I'll put a link for that below too. And reach out and we'll see how we can help you with that. Now, as I've mentioned a couple of times, I want to mention again, if you're not able to support the channel financially, or it's just not your thing, I don't want anybody to ever feel left out or that you're not appreciated. We appreciate every person that comes to the channel. Now, if you enjoy the channel, another way you can support us is by hitting the like button. If there's a video that you enjoy, subscribing to the channel, and maybe even hitting the little bell. That way you'll know when we release new shows. Well, anyway, we're just glad that you're here, and now it's time to get on with the show, so sit back, relax, enjoy the show, and as always, thanks for tuning in. What's the matter? What is it? Another case for Nick Carter, Master Detective. Yes, it's another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Tonight's curious adventure... State's prison evidence on Nick Carter and the mystery of the midnight robbery. Pardon me, uh... Could you let me have a line? Certainly. There you are. Swell night, isn't it? Yes, indeed. It's a pleasure to walk on a night like this. Yeah. Well, thanks. Not at all. Good night. Good night. Yes, even in a big city like this, the stars are just... Help! What? Help! I wonder what's wrong with her. Help! I beg your pardon, but is there anything I can do? <laughs> can I help you? Is, is something wrong? Murder! Murder? Who is it? My uncle. When did it happen? I don't know. Well, where is he? In the library. In this big house right here? Yes. Oh, it's awful. You shouldn't be out here in your night clothes. It's too chilly. Come. Let me take you back to the house. Come on. Yes. Back to the house. Did you call the police? No. I, I just saw him lying there in a pool of blood. Then I... I came out here to get help. Well, I'm Nick Carter, the detective. I'll be glad to help you if I can. Now, careful going up the steps. <laughs> there we are. Now, you'll show me the library. He's... He's in there. Oh, yes. I see. He's dead, all right. Who found him? The housekeeper. She came in late and saw a light still on in here. She looked in to see if he needed anything and saw... Then she called you? Yes. And you are... I'm Ella Jabot, his niece. I've lived here with him for the last five years since my mother died. I see. Has anything been touched since the body was found? No. Nobody's been in here at all. Good. Uh -huh. Shot through the head. Close range. Well, I... Looks as if he did it himself. No. 
no. Well, here's the pistol that was used right beside him. Did you hear the shot? No. I sleep at the opposite end of the house. Oh, Mr. Carter, please find whoever killed my uncle. What makes you think he didn't kill himself? He wouldn't do a thing like that. I know it. Well, that's hardly evidence, Miss Ella. Did you see this note? Note? I know. Your uncle apparently left it propped up here in his desk. It's addressed to Mrs. Sarah Jarbeau, 7 Dunner Street, City. Do you know her? I never heard of her. What does it say? Let's see. My dear madam, you've been a widow in fact ever since the hour following our marriage. But before day breaks, you will be a widow in name also, for I shall be dead. I have at last learned the truth. The one who told me right after our wedding ceremony that you were everything evil has at last confessed that you were really as good as I believed you to be. It's too late for me to ask you to forgive me for the great wrong I've done you. So I'm taking this way of making what amends I can. The upper drawer of my desk is my will, which leaves everything to you, a repentant husband, Enos Jarbeau. Well, that's a remarkable document. Did you know anything about your uncle ever having been married? No, I never heard that before. Well, that note would seem to prove it was suicide. I know better. May I see that note? Of course. Here. I knew it, Mr. Carter. My uncle didn't kill himself, and he didn't write this note either. Isn't that your uncle's handwriting? It looks very much like it, but he didn't write it. Uncle didn't use this kind of pen. What do you mean? Uncle Enos was very proud of his handwriting, and he never used anything but a special type of old-fashioned steel pen point. It has a very fine point. I see. Yes. This note was undoubtedly written with a stub point. Another thing, Mr. Carter. Uncle never wrote anywhere except at his desk here. And this desk has been locked since yesterday morning, and I have the key. How long have you had it? I borrowed it yesterday morning because I had some letters to write, and I've had it ever since. Is there another key to this desk? No. Uncle would never write anywhere else. You're quite a convincing detective, Miss Ella. And if you're right, this can't be suicide in spite of the other evidence. I know I'm right. Uncle would never have taken his own life. I believe you. And I'm just curious enough about this to do a little investigating myself. If I'm as good a detective as you are... I'll find your uncle's murderer in short order. You think this Mrs. Sarah Blake is the woman you want, Nick? I'm not sure, Patsy. But when the maid told me that she never heard of Mrs. Sarah Jarbeau, but that Mrs. Sarah Blake lives here, I thought I'd better talk to her. She might be Mrs. Jarbeau using her maiden name. Here she comes now. You uh, wish to speak to me? I'm looking for Mrs. Sarah Jarbeau. Do you know her? I do. I am Sarah Charbeau. You were right, Nick. My name is Bill Peters. I'm a reporter. I'm writing a story on the sudden death of your husband, Enos Charbeau. Oh, the poor man. He died to make up to me for my years of heartbreak. Yes, I, I saw the note he left. Would you please tell me what happened? Well, I met him one summer on the coast of Maine. We were married in the fall. We took a train for Boston. And on the way, he went into the smoking car to smoke a cigar. I never saw him again. Why, that's terrible. Why didn't he come back? I only know that when the train reached the station, a messenger gave me $500 and a note. Oh. It said that he had learned I was not a good woman and that I should never see him again. But didn't you try to clear it up? No. If he believed it, I would never seek to persuade him otherwise. I've worked as a governess ever since. I see. Well, uh, thank you very much, Mrs. Jarbo. Come along, Patsy. Goodbye, Mrs. Jarbell. I hope you'll be happy now. Thank you. And goodbye. Hmm. She certainly got a tough break. You know, Patsy, I was prepared to doubt everything mm -hmm. she told me, but somehow I'm inclined to believe her story, even if it does spoil my theory that she's part of an elaborate put-up job. Which way are you going from here? Oh, well, I think I'll... Pardon me. Uh, would you let me have a light? Oh, yes, of course. Here you are. Thanks. Nice day, isn't it? Yes, very pleasant. Thanks. So long. So long. Well, come along, Patsy. Uh, wait a minute. Hmm? I'd met that man somewhere before. He asked me for a light just that same way. Where was it? Well, of course. It was outside Jarbo's house last night right after the murder. You mean you think he... Wait a minute. Watch a minute. I want to see if he... Yes. He's going into the house we just left. Right. If he and Mrs. Jarbo know each other, the chances are her story is a phony. Oh, but Nick, she sees us... I know us what I know, Patsy, but this changes things. Patsy... 
I want you to find out what you can about old Eno Zarbo's past. Find out about that marriage, if there ever was one. But first, call Scubby and tell him to get here right away. Okay. That man leaves before Scubby gets here. I'll follow myself. Otherwise, Scubby can tail him. But I've got to know where he goes and what he does. Right now, he's our one positive clue. <laughs> Is it all right to talk in here, Nick? The lobby of the big hotel is probably the safest place in the world to talk in, Scubby. Well, what'd you find out? Well, I followed him over to a saloon over on 3rd Avenue. Yeah? There was a fellow waiting there for him. I tried to hear what they talked about, but all I could get was the name Jarbeau. Yeah, I heard that several times. I thought so. But just as I was really getting in close, a couple of plain clothes cops came along and pinched him. Pinched him? What for? Well, it seems he broke out of state's prison three days ago. I heard the cops call him Barney McCoy. Barney McCoy. Yeah. Jailbird from state's prison. Ah, pardon me, Scubby. I want to speak to the desk clerk. Oh, sure, Nick, but what do you have to... Oh, clerk, I'd like to yes. speak to the governor's suite, please. Yes, Mr. Carter. Uh, use booth number two right over there, please. Thank you. Oh, Nick, what in the world do you want to talk to the governor for? Just have a remember, Scubby. He's stopping at this very hotel for a few days. I want him to do me... Uh... Hello, Mr. Secretary. Well, this is Nick Carter. I'd like to speak to the governor a moment, if I may. Thank you. Hello, governor. This is Nick Carter. Fine, thanks. Governor, I want to go to state's prison. Oh, no, not as a visitor. I want to go as a convict. Nick, are you nuts? No, I mean it. If you can spare me five minutes, I think I can convince you. Thanks, I'll be right up. Ella, I asked you to meet me here at my office because I'm going to be out of town for a few days. And I want to have everything straight before I leave. Uh, has anything further happened? Nothing, Mr. Carter, except that Mrs. Jarbeau has installed herself in the house as its mistress. She's very unpleasant to me, and I know she'd like me to leave. Oh, you stay right there. Did the will leave anything to you? No, Mr. Carter. Everything went to her. I can't understand it. I can. That will is forged. But the will is an uncle's handwriting, and both the witnesses to the will have identified their signatures as genuine. And the will was found where the note said it would be. Well, nevertheless, I'm convinced the will's a fake. Betsy, what did you find out? Nina Charbeau and Sarah Blake were married right enough. I found the record in a little church on the south side. Hmm. Sarah really is his wife. Ford's will doesn't make sense. And neither does a suicide note which Charbeau didn't write. Maybe he did kill himself after all, Mr. Carter. Maybe he just forgot about me. No, I don't believe it, Ella. I don't either. And Ella... I'm going to prove I'm right, even if I... even if I have to go to jail to do it. Oh, you're the new man. Yeah, Warden. What's your name? Max Herbert. Where were you born? Buffalo, New York. How old are you? Thirty-three. Nationality? American. Married? Nope. Crime? Housebreaking. Very well. The guard will take you to the photographers and then to the laboratory. Well, fella, you've been here three days. How do you like working in this shoe shop? I don't like it. I'm not cut out for it. What are you in for? Second story job. What'd I get you for? Cracking a safe. There's four of us. Two of them got away. Me and McCoy was nailed cold. McCoy? Hey, you wouldn't mean Barney McCoy, would you? Yeah. Yeah, you know him? Sure, know him well. Great guy. Yeah, sure is. And you know his wife? Yeah, some. He's a darn smart woman, Eddie is. Eddie? Yeah. Thought her name was Sarah. No, no, his wife's Eddie. Sarah was his sister. Yeah, they look so much alike, you couldn't tell one from the other. Yeah. Well, what became of Sarah? I don't know. She married some rich guy for his money, but left it flat. I don't know what happened after that. Eddie's still in town waiting for Mac to get out. Yeah, he did break out a few days ago. He just caught him and brought him back here. Yeah. And yeah, they got him on the rock pile for trying to escape. Hey, cut out that talking, you guys. Get back to work. Okay, okay. So Barney McCoy is on the rock pile now. I rather think I'd like to be transferred to the rock pile myself. Hey, Barney. Yeah. Look. 
You've known me now for almost two weeks. Yeah. So what? You know, I wouldn't give you a bum steer, don't you? What are you leading up to, Max? I'm working on a way to get out of here. Before I come up here, I heard you on the level. I'd like to let you in on it. Where did you ever hear of me outside this place? Oh, the big town. A girl named Sarah told me about you. What? You married her sister, Eddie. You know Sarah? Sure. About five, six years ago. Haven't seen her since, though. Uh, Sarah's, uh, Sarah's in Europe now. Yeah. When are you planning on getting out of here? As soon as I get the necessary people lined up. If I had some dough, we could get out of here tomorrow. How much do you need? About 200 to start with. Okay. I'll have it for you tomorrow. Okay, Max. You get that stuff and we'll be out of here in two days. All right, you get five minutes to talk. Hey, Nick, why don't you... Hold it, hold it. I'm Max Herbert in here. Oh, I'm sorry. I should have remembered. How in the world did you ever get in this place? Well, the governor fixed it so that I was caught red-handed robbing the home of a friend of his. Yeah. When they caught me, I had the family silver in one hand and the family jewels in the other. <laughs> it was easy. And now you arranged to be transferred to the gang where McCoy's working. Well, have you found anything? Yes, but it's all circumstantial. But Barney McCoy and I are breaking out of here day after tomorrow. And I'm hoping to get some proof then. Are you sure you're getting out of here? Yes. One of the keepers is working with us. Oh. I think this same keeper fixed McCoy's getaway last time. And I also think, from what I've heard, that he may have helped in Jarbo's murder. Yeah? I've learned positively that he was absent from the prison on leave that day. But isn't there danger if you're getting hurt if you try to break out of here? Of course there is. I have to take that chance. I've got to stick to McCoy. Don't worry, Scubby. I'll be all right. I hope... <laughs> All set, McCoy? All set. Everything's fixed. Good. You see that delivery truck over there, Max? Yeah. Well, that's going to break down when it tries to start. I get it. We'll have to help it get out of the yard here. Right. Listen. He's trying to start it now. The guard all set. Sure. Mike's with us all the way. Same as before. Hey, you over there. That's us. Come on. Gavin, give us a hand with this truck. Okay. What's the matter? Motor won't start. Have to give him a push. You two get a hold here and give him a start. Okay, Mike. Rest of you guys get back to work. All right, get your shoulder behind it, Max. Okay. Let's go. All right. Heave. All right, again. Heave. Once more. Oh, come on, get it going. We ain't got all day. Heave. As soon as the motor starts, jump on the truck. Right, I got you. Okay, again. There. Come on, Max. I'm in. Get down so they can't see you. Look. The bridge over the railroad tracks is just ahead. When we get over the tracks, be ready to jump. Be right with you. All right, now. Come on. Right behind you, Barney. Jump on the tender of that engine below us. Now. Okay. You all right, McCoy? Yeah. Come on, engineer. Give her all the steam you got. Don't stop the talk. You, fireman, feed the coal to her. I don't want to use this gun unless I have to. What's out, Max? The outside wall of the prison is just ahead. You'd better duck. There's going to be shooting. Right, McCoy. All okay so far? Oh, here it comes. Watch it. Uh, look at it. Pour it out. <laughs> Well, we're out of jail now, and for good. It's good to see you back in your office again, Mr. Carter. Yes, it's good to be back here, Ella. Now tell me, have you learned anything interesting since I last saw you? I think so, Mr. Carter. Now let's have it. A few months ago, our housekeeper spent about a month visiting her son in California. Before she went, she put an ad in the paper for a temporary housekeeper. Several women answered the ad, and uh, Mrs. Martin was given the job. She had light brown hair and wore dark glasses. I disliked her on sight, and I'm sure she disliked me. When our housekeeper returned, this Mrs. Martin left, and I never saw her again until the day my uncle was buried. What do you mean, Ella? On that day, she presented herself as my uncle's widow. Your uncle's widow? Yes, Mr. Carter. 
When she first came to live in the house after the funeral, I thought there was something very familiar about her. But not until a few days ago did I suddenly realize that Mrs. Jarbeau was Mrs. Morton, with black hair instead of brown and without her dark glasses. Ella, could you swear to that? No, but some of her little mannerisms, certain tricks of speech, uh, a funny way of walking, all make me positive. And that explains the mystery of how the fake will was forged. While Mrs. Martin was substituting for the housekeeper, she could have found out about the will, taken it out, had a new one forged, and then returned it. The night your uncle was murdered, the forged will was substituted for the original one in the desk drawer by using a duplicate key that had been prepared in advance. And it might interest you, Nick, to know that when Ella told me this the other day, I checked at the house where we first met Mrs. Jarbeau. The woman there told me that Mrs. Jarbeau was away on a visit during the month that Mrs. Martin took the place of Ella's housekeeper. Good work. That settles it, Betsy. Just a minute, Mr. Carter. There's another thing you better know. Something else? Yes, Mr. Carter. Last evening, a strange man came to the house. He and Mrs. Jarbeau were apparently old friends because she called him Mac. Barney McCoy. She took him up to her room where I heard them talking for a long time. I tried to hear what they were saying but couldn't get close enough. But I did hear him say it was time to get that girl out of the way for good. Hmm. And then Mrs. Jarbeau said that now that Mac was back, it was time to wind up the job. Well, Ella, if everything goes as I hope it will, we'll be the ones to wind up the job, not Mrs. Jarbeau. Anything else you want me to do? Yes. Meet me in the rear of your home tomorrow night at 11 o'clock. <laughs> we'll make our final arrangements then. In the meantime, sit tight and keep your ears and eyes open. <laughs> Mr. Carter. Mr. Carter. That you, Ella? Yes. Come into the living room here. We can talk better. Okay. Sure there's no one around? Not now. That man, Mac, was here earlier, but he left quite a while ago. Mrs. Jarbeau has gone up to her room. We can talk safely here. All right. Don't turn on the light. Maybe seen. We can talk just as well in the dark. Whatever you say. Now tell me. Does Mrs. Jarbeau know you've ever seen this man, Mac? Oh, no. I've kept out of the way whenever he's been around. Good. Do you know what he came here for this evening? Uh, there was talk about chloroform and poison. And then she told him the lawyer for the, for the estate was here this afternoon mm -hmm. and said that she would be in full legal possession of the estate in another few days. I see. And then he said that if that was the case, it was the time to act before it was too late. Well, it's time for us to act, too. I think we'd better... Quiet. Somebody's unlocking the door through which we came. Maybe they won't come in here. Who's in this room? I can't see you in the dark, but I know you're there. Who's there? Who are you? None of your business. Speak up or I'll shoot. If you do, you'll never live to see another What's day. What's going on in here? Why isn't the light on? Mrs. Jabot. Ella. What are you Barnaby doing Barnaby McCoy, you... Max Herbert, by all this holy. What are you doing here? Why, I, uh... Oh, you see, Barney, I, uh... Yeah? Uh, He's here because he loves me. Don't you know this man is an ex-convict? You ought to be serving a sentence in state's prison right now. Yes, I know that. Well, that's why we had to meet like this, Barney. Is this true, Ella? Yes, Mrs. Jabot, it is. Hmm. Look here, you. You interviewed me a couple of weeks ago, said you were writing a story for your paper. You said then your name was Peters. Now you say it's Herbert. Well, my real name is Herbert Peters, ma'am. You see, I... And you. I, uh, what are you doing here? I'm a night watchman on duty in this neighborhood. I saw this man come in here and followed him. Recognized him as a suspicious character. You're both lying. Get out of here, both of you, immediately. And as for you, Ella, get upstairs at once. I'll deal with you later. Well, that's all the thanks I get for trying to protect your place against thieves. I will get out. Come on, you. Go ahead, Barney. I'm coming. Good night, Ella, dear. And see that you never come back. Either of you. Hey, Max. Yeah? Was that story about you and the girl straight? Why, sure, Barney. Wasn't your story on the level? Well, to... Tell you the truth, I was going to see if I could find a few things I could swipe. <laughs> I'm flat broke. You haven't got a few bucks on you, have you? Sure, Barney. I can let you have a ten spot. What? Here. Gee, thanks, pal. I won't forget you for this. Forget it. Yeah, we sure were lucky to get out of there so easy. Yeah, 
I thought the old dame was going to have us pinched. You're under arrest, both of you, so don't try to get me. Right. There you go. Sit down. Let go of me. Stop. Stop or I'll shoot. No, you don't. You let go of my arm. You made me miss it. So what? Yep. Well, I got you anyway. You won't get away. You're going back to state's prison again, Mr. Max Herbert. Oh, you know my name, do you? I sure do. And I know yours, Ben Lyons. But... You know me? Hey, let me look at you. Gladly. Come over onto the street light. All right. You know me now? Well, well Nick Carter. <laughs> well, I'll be... Well, gosh, I'm sorry, Mr. Carter, but a, a woman just called the station, said she'd passed two escaped convicts in front of her house, and if we hurried, we could pick them up. Even give us their names, too, well, so I... Could... Now, Ben, listen to me. I'm on the trail of something big. Have the lieutenant and eight men meet me at 12 o'clock tomorrow night at the back of the Jarbeau place across the street where they won't be seen. Okay. Be sure to tell them not to fail me. Because I expect to capture the murderers of Enos Yarbo. Are all the men posted as we agreed, Scubby? Yes, Nick. Outside and inside the house. Good. They have orders to let anybody come up here, but to let nobody go downstairs again. And we're ready for the finale in this case. And what's that you've got there, Nick? It's a new type of microphone, Patsy. Oh. I've attached it to the wall between this room and Mrs. Jarbo's room. Mm-hmm. Through the vibration of the wall, it'll pick up whatever is said in her room. Then whatever is picked up is amplified so that it's loud enough for us to hear it. The amplifier also has a recording device which makes a permanent record of the conversation on a wire tape. Gosh, what will they think of next? Quiet now. Let's listen. I'll turn it on. But I tell you, Barney, we can't lose. In a few more days, the whole Jarbo estate will be mine, legally. I know, Addie, but can you handle that girl for a few days more? That's well, if McCoy. I can't, we'll give her what we gave the old man. Do we have to? If she's dead, we know she ain't going to bother us. Yeah. So, is that... Hey, what the devil's that? Quiet. How do I know? The housekeeper's answering it. Hey, somebody's coming up here. Did you tell anybody you were coming up here? Anybody here? Mike! Come on. What are you doing here? Well, that's a fine question to ask me. I'm here because you sent for me. Who sent for you? You did, McCoy. You're crazy. I did nothing of the kind. I got your note this morning. It is. What? Come to Jarbo House tonight, but not before 12. Everything okay. Very important. And it's signed, Barney. Listen, I never wrote that note. Well, if you didn't, it means trouble for us. Somebody else knows about this business besides us three. You, You mean we're caught? We ain't caught yet. But we will be if we don't watch our step. Even now, I was baby. afraid of this. I knew I should have kept down a bit. Ah, shut up, you rat. You're not in jail yet. But I'm going to be. I can feel it coming. Well, don't shut up, Mike. I'll bring you. You did it, McCoy. You fired the shot that killed the old man. I just shut up. You just get it. I Come on, kids. That's enough of that. Let's go. Right with you, Nick. Tom, you gotta get out. I'll take it easy, Sarah. Wait a minute, will you? I can't wait any longer. Get your hands up, both of you. And no funny business. Max, what are you... No, McCoy, not Max. Nick Carter. Nick Carter? You ain't got nothing on us. Oh, Nick's got enough on you three to send you to the chair. Yes, McCoy, we know the whole plot from beginning to end. Tell him what we found out, Nick. What do you mean? It means I know that Sarah married Jarbo, and that shortly afterwards she died. You, Addie, her sister, married McCoy. When Sarah died, you found her marriage certificate and decided to use your resemblance to her to get the old man's money. McCoy was in prison then, but you arranged with the guard Mike here to help McCoy escape when the time was ripe. Then to pay Mike for his trouble, you cut him in on the deal. Then you, Eddie, got that temporary job here as a housekeeper, which was an unexpected break. While you were here, you had the fake will made. Then when all was ready, McCoy escaped as planned. Mike came with him, and between the three of you, you chloroformed old Jarbo, and then shot him in such a way that it looked like suicide. How do you know it wasn't suicide? The suicide note you left for the old man. Whoever Eddie got to forge that will for her did such an expert job that the witnesses recognized their own forged signatures as genuine. But whoever wrote that suicide note was so clumsy that he wrote it with a blunt-pointed fountain pen instead of the sharp-pointed steel pen that was the only pen Jarbo ever used. That ain't proof. That's guessing. We've got plenty of proof, McCoy. And if that isn't enough, to top it all off, the conversation in this room between you three crooks has been recorded in full for the past 20 minutes. And if that isn't practically a confession and good legal evidence in any court, my name isn't Nick and Carter. This was another strange experience of Nick Carter, Master Detective, called State's Prison Evidence, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Midnight Murder. 
Another of the curious adventures of Nick Carter, which are brought to you regularly at the same time each week by WOR Mutual. And now, Nick, what about our story for next week? Well, next week's story started off as a simple question of who stole the firm's funds. But it ended up by being the very perplexing question of who killed two men and caused the death of a third. And not the least puzzling part of the case was to find out who fired the fatal bullet which started off the murders. Well, isn't that usually the most puzzling part of a murder story? Well, yes, it is. But in this case, the man who was killed was standing by my side in the corridor of a large office building. And there was no one around at the time who could have fired the gun that killed him. I'm afraid I'm getting more mixed up all the time. <laughs> That's exactly how we felt about it. But Nick cleared it all up in spite of everything. And we'll tell you all about it next week. So long. So long, folks. And so long to you, Nick and Patsy. See you next week. In the strange adventure you've just heard, Nick Carter was impersonated by Lon Clark, Patsy by Helen Choate, and Scubby by John Kane. Original music was played by Lou White. The entire production was written and directed by Jock McGregor. Next week at the same time, another curious experience of Nick Carter entitled An Angle on Murder. Or Nick Carter and the mystery of the mutilated bullet. This story is a copyrighted feature of Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. The Return of Nick Carter is produced in the studios of WOR and is broadcast over most of these stations every Monday evening at 9.30 Eastern War Time. This is Mutual. Another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Tonight's curious adventure... An Angle on Murder. For Nick Carter and the mystery of the mutilated foot. Then I grabbed her, and I wound my fingers around her throat. I squeezed her windpipe tight. <laughs> Tighter. <laughs> Tighter. <laughs> What's the matter, Patsy? Oh, Nick, put the lights on. All right. And I said I wanted to hear the recorded confession you made of that mad murderer who killed his wife. I didn't think I'd have to listen to it in the dark. Well, that's the way we got him to confess in the first place. Oh, I'll take it, Patsy. Okay, Nick. Nick Carter's office. Uh, I'd like to talk to Mr. Nicholas Carter. This is Nick Carter speaking. Oh, hello, Nick. This is John Hamill, the banker's associates. Oh, hello, John. How've you been? Nick, I'm in trouble. I can't discuss it over the phone. How soon can you meet me? Where? On West Street, around the corner from the Greystone building, where my offices are. Please get there as fast as you can. All right, John. I'll be there in ten minutes. Thank you. Scubby, you understand exactly what you're to do? Yeah, Nick. Okay, I'll see you later. I've got a date in this corner. Okay, Nick. I'll be seeing you. Hey, look at that car coming up the street, would you? Hey, Nick, watch out. That car is headed right at you. Jump, Nick. Oh. oh, did he hit you, Nick? Are you all right? Yeah, I'm all right. Oh, gee, that was close. It almost seemed like whoever was driving that car did that on purpose. Wouldn't be at all surprised, Scubby. I think somebody is interested in preventing me from keeping my appointment. Hey, look, maybe I better stay with you, Nick. No, I've got something else for you to do, Scubby. I got the number in that car. Hop down to the license bureau and find out who it belongs to. Then wait for me at the office. <laughs> Oh, Nick. Uh, sorry, I'm so late. Oh, hello, John. 
I've been on this corner waiting for you for 20 minutes. Where have you been? Trying to get here without anyone seeing me. Well, why all the mystery? What's up? Wait a minute, Nick. Here, get back in this doorway, quick. Don't let him see us. Well, who was that? Somebody trailing you? I don't know. I never saw him before. Well, then why do you want to dodge him? You haven't done anything wrong, have you? No, Nick. Absolutely nothing. Now listen, I don't want the police in on this just yet, if I can help it. A banking firm like mine can't stand any unnecessary notoriety. Oh, yes, I know, John, but what's this all about? Well, let me explain. I wanted to tell you out here where I can be sure no one will hear us. You see, Nick, several days ago I discovered there's a serious shortage on our books. Somebody has been taking money from the accounts, and I'm almost, almost sure I know who it is. I've called a meeting of my four partners... They're upstairs in my office waiting for me right now to have a showdown before the stockholders find out. That's why I ask you to come over here, Nick. You may have to make an arrest tonight. Well, you don't want a detective, John. You want a cop. No, no, no. You're wrong, Nick. I want you. Please come along. Well, perhaps you better wait down the lobby while I go up and see if everything's all right. That is safe for you. Tonight. No, no, Nick. There's no need for that. All right. I now. want to be in on the showdown. Come on. Anything you say. And if you really feel that something dangerous is in the wind, I think I should go up there first and look around. And if everything's okay, let you know. No, no. I want to go up now and get it over with. Well, you insist. I do, Nick. Oh, I know it's pretty late, but I waited purposely till the offices were closed to avoid any publicity. This whole business requires the greatest secrecy. <laughs> Twenty-fourth floor. Oh, this is our floor, Nick. After you, John. Oh, thank you. Kind of dark in this hallway, isn't it? Yes, the lighting isn't any too good here, but... Uh... John! John! John, are you hurt bad? Nick. Nick. What's happening? Why is it John? Uh, quiet, please, quiet. Gentlemen. John Hamill is dead. John oh, Hamill is dead, but that's terrible, terrible. How did it happen? That's what I want to know. You seem to know him. Who are you? Well, I could ask you the same question. Who are you? I'm Nick Carter. Nick Carter, the detective? Yes. Oh, well, my name's Tom Burdick. I'm one of Hamill's partners, and uh, uh, these are the others. Uh, Mr. Carter, I'm Emil Garrick, and this is Arthur Nelson and Alan Cornish. How do you do, Mr. Carter? You're Cornish, huh? Yes, Mr. Carter. What do you know about this? Nothing, nothing. I, I was in my office all the time. Oh, that's not true, Cornish. I saw you go out in the hall just a few seconds before Hamill was shot. That right, Cornish? Yes, I... I did go out for a moment. But when the shot was fired, I was back in my office. But why question me? Why don't you ask Burdick where he was or Nelson McCallick? Well, I can easily explain where Mr. Nelson and I were. We were both together in my office preparing some papers for tonight's meeting. That's right, Mr. Carter. I was with Mr. Garrick. Which of you men belong to which office? Well, you can see the layout yourself, Mr. Carter. They all open off this L-shaped corridor. First comes Nelson's office, then Burdick's. There, on the long leg of the L. And on the corner at the end is Cornish's office, directly in line with the corridor to the elevator. And Garrick's office is around the corner on the short leg of the L. That's right. Hmm. That's out of sight of the elevator completely, isn't it? Sure. You can't even see the corridor from my office. So I see. Then, Cornish, your office is the only one which faces the corridor. I'd like to have a look at it. All right. This way. This is my office, Mr. Carter. Hmm. Peculiar order here. Let's see. Well, what are we here in this umbrella stand? A gun. A bottle. What did you say? And it's been fired very recently. I should say, gentlemen, this was the murder weapon. That's Mr. Cornish's umbrella stand. What do you know about this, Cornish? I don't know anything about it. But that gun belongs to Mr. Cornish. That's right, Mr. Carter. I've seen it in his desk many times. I recognize that fancy handle. Say, what are you fellows trying to do? Well, sure, it's my gun. But I haven't seen it for three days. Someone stole it on my desk, Mr. Carter. Why didn't you report it to the police? Because I... I didn't carry a permit for it. I... I was afraid of getting in trouble. Cornish, I regret that appearances are against you. I'm afraid I'll have to turn you over to the police. You won't turn me over to the police! So what happened to the light? Cornish, turn him out! Turn those lights on, sir! Let me out, Mr. Carter! Let me go, Carter! It's Cornish! He's escaping down the hall! Stop, Cornish! Stop, Rose! <laughs> See, 
Patsy, I was right with Hamill when he was murdered. What I can't figure out was how he was shot when there was no one else in the hall with us. Don't ask me, Nick. And here's something else. I heard only one shot fired, but Cornish's gun had three empty shells. And to top it all off, here's the bullet that killed Hamill. The coroner gave it to me. Notice how it's all banged up? Yes. How did that happen? Well, I wish I knew. Patsy, if I knew the answer to that, I think I know the answer to this whole case. But we find Cornish. Hello, Carter? Yes, this is Nick Carter. Oh, this is Alan Cornish. I... I suppose I'm a fool for calling him up, Carter, but I need help. I'm desperate and I can't go to the police. You've got to help me prove I didn't kill Hamill. Why'd you run away, Cornish? Because I was scared. Lucky for me you didn't hit me. Don't worry, Cornish. If I'd really wanted to hit you, I would have. Where are you now? I'll tell you, but you've got to promise to come alone. If you don't... The only thing I'll promise you is that I won't do anything until I have to have talked to you. Now, what's the address? 1813 Oak Street. I'm right over. I'll be waiting for you. Okay, sit tight. I'll be there. You mean we'll be there. I'm sick of sitting around here. I'm going with you. Eighteen thirteen Oak Street. This is it, Betsy. Gosh, what a creepy looking place. Ah, certainly not very attractive. Well, come on, let's go in. Maybe he's not here. He said he'd be here. I wonder if... It... Well, the door's open. Should we go in? We can't keep our date with Cornish if we don't. Gosh, it's dark in here. Nick, do you suppose it could be a trap? You never can be quite sure, Patsy. Now, here's the door. Stand behind me. Can you see anything in there, Nick? Wait till I get my flashlight. No. Looks deserted. Oh, come on. Let's try another room. Oh, gee, this place gives me the jitters. It's practically deserted. Maybe he's in here. Stand back, Patsy. No. Nothing in there. Oh, maybe he got scared after he called you and slipped away. I'll well, soon find out. There's another door. Over there. Look, Nick. Is that... Yes. He's hanged himself. Well, Nick, I don't know why he came back to the office again tonight. Cornish is dead. I guess that closes the case. Patsy, I'm not satisfied. When I talked to him on the phone, he certainly didn't sound like a man who was going to kill himself. When a man wants to prove himself innocent, he doesn't commit suicide. No, Patsy, there's something about that hanging that's bothering me, and I can't lay my finger on it. You probably figured that was the best way out. To kick over the chair and end it all. Patsy, remind me to give you a raise. Then what did I do? I've got it! Look, Patsy, Cornish was a short man. Well, so what? Patsy, Cornish couldn't have hanged himself. Well, why not? Don't you remember, Patsy? The only furniture in that room was a bed. And Cornish was so short, he never could reach that noose from the bed where it was. Of course, Nick. The bed was on the other side of the room. Patsy Cornish was murdered. She eliminates him as a suspect. Probably he was killed by the same man who killed Hamill. But who, Nick? Who? Wish I knew. Wish I knew. Hiya, Nick. Hiya, Patsy. Oh, that isn't the missing link. Scubby, did you find out anything about that car that nearly ran me down this afternoon? Oh, you bet, Nick. Good. But what a time I've been having. Lately, you know what I have to tell you. Well, I had to get the license commissioner out of bed to get it, but, oh boy, it was worth it. Hey, do you know who that car belongs to? Tom Burdick, Hamill's partner. Good boy, Scubby. You get his address, too? Yeah, some deserted neck of the woods out in Long Island. I've got the address here somewhere. Fine. Come on, Scubby. You and I are going to pay him a visit. You know, Scubby, the more I think of it, the more it looks as if Tom Burdick might be mixed up in this somewhere. Oh, I hope so, Nick. Otherwise, we're using up a lot of gas in this jalapia mine for nothing. Hey, have you noticed anything funny, Nick? You mean that car that's been trailing us for the last few minutes? That's it. What do you make of it, Nick? I don't know, Scubby. And I think we'll be finding out quickly enough. They're overtaking us. Better step on it. Okay, Nick. Here we go. How are we doing? Not so good, Scubby. They're still gaining on us. Can you give her any more gas? I'll try. There. 
they still coming up? Yes, Gabby. And fast. Gosh, Gabby, they're shooting at us. Ah, you're telling me. Watch it. Here they come. Well, I've done all I can, Nick. This old bus won't go any faster. Well, let's try no sticks, Gabby. When they get close to us, slam on your brakes and pull over to the side of the road. Yeah? They won't be expecting that. It may throw them completely off balance and spoil their aim. Okay, Nick. You say when. Now, pull over. Okay. Oh, boy. That was a close one. Are you all right, Nick? Yeah. Well, we won't see them anymore for a while. Get going, Scabby. we got to make up for lost time. Well, Nick, I've got to hand it to you. You have the darndest way of getting into a cellar. Well, we had to get into Rudy's house somehow. This cellar with its creek entrance from the garage looked like the safest way. Especially with those two vicious-looking dogs posted at both the front and back doors to the house. Well, they sure were big ones, too. I'd hate to meet one of them. Hey, where do you think this is going to lead us to, Nick? We should find a stairway going upstairs. That's I'm very much mistaken. Yeah? Yeah. Here's one. All right, let's go up. Wait, careful. All right, Nick, you lead the way. I'm with you. Here's the door. I hope it's open. No, darn it, it's locked. I'll soon fix that. There. All right, Scubby, come on. No, wait, wait, wait. Someone's coming into the room, Scubby. Get back. We can hear through the crack of the door. I'll leave it open in a little. Well, Mrs. Burdick, I'm certainly glad you called me up. I'm only too happy to be here at a time like this. After all, we're practically neighbors, aren't we? Oh, I just had to talk to someone, Mr. Garrick. I'm so worried about Tom and those horrible things that have been happening at the office. What do you make of all this? Well, I wouldn't worry about it too much, Mrs. Burdick. I'm sure Tom can take care of himself, if he has to. What do you mean, Mr. Garrick? Oh, nothing, nothing. But he has been acting rather strangely lately. Well, that's just it. I'm so worried. I haven't seen or heard from him all day. He's never been so late coming home from the office. Well, it's after 11. Oh, there's really nothing to worry about, Mrs. Burdick, even in a case like this. Of course, it looks very peculiar for Tom to be missing his way, especially at this particular time. Mr. Garrick, um, you don't think Tom had anything to do with all this sort of... Well, Mrs. Burdick, I like Tom very much. I would hate to think that Tom had anything to do with this murder. Of course, the... Oh, Scubby, we don't seem to be learning much this way. Might as well go in and let him know we're here. Sure, Nick. Good evening, Mr. Garrick. Why, Mr. Carter, what are you doing here? I just came along with one of my assistants, Scubby Wilson, to talk to Mr. Burdick. We came in this way because we didn't want to disturb the dogs. Oh, really? Who are you? Oh, Mrs. Burdick, uh, this is Mr. Nick Carter. He's in charge of investigating Hamill's death. Mr. Carter, the detective? Nothing's happened to Tom, has it? I don't believe so, Mrs. Burdick. I just want to ask him a few questions when he arrives. Well, maybe that's why Tom hasn't come home. Maybe he's afraid of... Uh, maybe that's he now. Wait, wait, I'll go look out the window to see if that's his car. Carter, I must warn you to be careful. Burdick's a dangerous man. Tom! Tom! Nick Carter's here! Please, Mrs. Burdick, come away from that window. Nick Carter's here to see you. You won't do me any good that way, Mrs. Tom. Burdick. Tom! Stop it, you hear me, please. Hey, that's his car, Mr. Carter. Look, he's getting away. Come on, Scubby, let's get after him. Okay, I'll go with you, Carter. Hurry up. I want to know why he runs away when he hears my name. say too much in front of Mrs. Burdick, but we've all been afraid of Burdick. All right, all right. Scubby, just keep your foot on that throttle and keep after him. Oh, boy, we sure made that one on two wheels. Nick, I'm pushing this crate as fast as she'll go, but we don't seem to be getting any closer. That car of Burdick's hits your step. As long as we hang on and don't lose him, I'll be satisfied. Hey, watch it. We're coming to a railroad crossing. So I see. Well, maybe we can head him off now. If Burdick tries to beat that limit to the crossing, he's crazy. that just came out of the operating room is signaling you. Oh, yes. She wants me to go into Burdick. You wait for me here, Scubby. Okay, Nick. Oh, Burdick. 
Carter, can you hear me? Yes, Carter. I can hear you. Carter, I'm a dying man. Yes, I, I know. I swear to you, I didn't kill Hamill or Cornish. Then why did you try to run me down with your car this afternoon? Carter, I didn't do that. All I know is that for several hours this afternoon, my car was mysteriously missing. I didn't find it again until I started home this evening. Bertie, why did you run away from your home tonight when your wife told you we were there? How about the securities we found on you after the wreck? It wasn't you. It was securities. I took them so that... Oh. Yes, Burdick? Why did you take them? I took them so I could keep him from stealing them. Who? Burdick, who? Burdick, who's he? Carter. Front office. Bottom drawer. Desk. Something will lead you to murderer. Yes, Burdick? Who's the murderer? He... He is... Burdick. Burdick. Poor chap. If you had spoken sooner, you might have lived longer. Nick! Oh, Nick, I got here as quick as I could. Have you found anything yet? I think so. Scubby Burdick wasn't lying to me. I found this in the bottom drawer of the desk in the front office here. A book? Well, is that what Burdick meant? Just look at that title. Studies of Various Angles of Bullets in Flight. Oh, so what, Nick? Scubby, that's the way Hamill was killed. It all adds up perfectly. Now I know why I heard only one shot when I found three empty shells in the murder weapon. Three shots were fired, but two of them were fired at a different time from the third. Well, do you know where the other two bullets are, Nick? I do. Follow me out in the hall and I'll show you. Yeah. You see, Scubby, as soon as I found that book in the flight of bullets, I did a bit of looking around, and I finally found them. Oh, where are they? In the office here? No, Scubby, in the corridor. Right over there in that dark corner, embedded in the wall beside the elevator shaft, about a half a dozen feet from where Hamill was killed. Well, what are they doing over there? Scubby, this was a very ingenious crime. And if you watch carefully, I'll show you just how ingenious it really was. Now, you notice that Cornish's office is the only one facing the corridor leading from the elevator. Yeah. So what? Well, in order to shoot someone coming down the hall, the murderer, if he were in any office but Cornish's, would have to step from his office out into this corridor and be seen. Right? Yeah, right. But our murderer was very clever. I got the answer when I located the book, and when I found these embedded in the wall beside the elevator shaft. The two missing bullets. Right. Well, hey, they're all banged up. Precisely, just like the murder bullet. And that's what gave me the answer. You see, Scubby, the murderer never left his office. He stood inside the front office, the one around the corner, on the lower leg of the L-shaped corridor, and aimed at that steel pillar built into the wall over there. When the bullet hit the steel face of the pillar, it was deflected into Hamill's lungs. Look here. You see these marks in the face of the pillar here? Where? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are the bullet marks. Oh, well, gosh, Nick, that's fantastic. Hey, are you sure you're right? Positive. Don't you see, Scubby? That explains the other two shots that were fired. They weren't fired at Hamill, and they weren't fired at the time the murder was committed. They were practice shots used by the murderer to be sure he had the correct angle from which to shoot Hamill. Gosh, Nick, I've certainly got to hand it to you. Yes, but we still have to get the murderer. But how? And who is it, Nick? I rather think that if we step back in the office and wait, we'll find out soon enough, Scubby. Well, what do you mean, Nick? I mean that whoever it is will be in this office within the next few minutes, because after my discoveries, I made a couple of phone calls. And I invited the two remaining partners to meet me here. Shh. Here comes someone now. No. No. How do you do, gentlemen? Oh, hello, Garrick. I got your phone call, Carter, and I got here as fast as I could. Garrick, have you seen this book before? Mm, Studies of various angles of bullets in flight. Why, yes, now that I think of it. I think I have. Does it belong to you? No, it doesn't. But I remember that one day when I was with Mr. Nelson, he stopped in front of a bookshop and looked at it. Rather closely now that I think of it. Yes, I'm sure it was Nelson. Very interesting. Now tell me, Mr. Garrick, when the murder was committed, are you positive that you and Mr. Nelson were in this office together? That's right, Mr. Carter. 
Can you show me exactly where each of you stood at the time the shot was fired? Well, now let me see. I was uh, here, facing the window, and Nelson was, well, standing uh, right about here by the door. Mm Mm-hmm. I see. Did you notice in which direction he was facing at the time? Yes, I remember. This way, facing the corridor. In other words, the way he was standing, you could see him only in profile. That's right. Well, there's no question that that's how it was done, Scubby. The murderer planted himself in this office so that he could establish a strong alibi. He then took the gun from his pocket, unseen by the other person in the room, who could see him only in profile, and then fired it at that steel pillar. Then as he ran into the corridor with the rest, after Hamill was dead, he dropped the gun into the umbrella stand in front of Cornish's office. Well, Carter, do you mean that Nelson is the one How who... do you do, gentlemen? Uh, did I hear my name mentioned? Yes, Nelson, you did. Why did you kill Hamill and Cornish? Please, Garrick, don't be ridiculous. Oh, Nelson... Does this book look familiar to you? Uh, this book? Uh, no, I can't say that it does. You sure you've never seen this book before? Hmm, now that you mention it, I may have glanced at it in a bookshop at one time or another, but then I look over a lot of books. I like to browse. I see. Nelson, see how you approve of this story of Hamill's murder. Yes, The killer knew of Cornish's criminal record, and he figured he could embezzle some of the firm's money and pin it on an innocent man. Then when he found out that Hamill was becoming suspicious and was having the accounts checked, he became panicky and afraid that it might not work out the way he had planned. So he decided to kill Hamill. Then when he happened to overhear Hamill's conversation with me over the telephone, he hurriedly borrowed Burdick's car without Burdick's knowledge and tried to get rid of me. That's an interesting way out, Mr. Carter. Have you also a theory as to who the killer is? I have. By the process of elimination, it has to be either you or Mr. Garrick or an unknown. And I've already proved that I didn't do it. It must have been an unknown then, Mr. Carter. I certainly didn't kill Hamill. I had nothing to do with the murder. When the shot was fired, I was right here in this room with Mr. Garrick. He can testify to that. He has already, Mr. Nelson. In fact, Mr. Carter, I was standing right here facing the window when the shot was fired. Oh, no. That's where I was, Mr. Carter. Standing here at the window. Now, please, Garrick. Please, please, gentlemen, please. You don't have to argue about it. I know who was at the window, and I know who fired the fatal shot. Scubby, take a look at the flyleaf of this book. Well, what are they, Nick? They look like the scribbles that some guys draw when they have nothing else to do. Oh, doodles, they call them. Exactly. While I was looking through the various offices, I found some papers with these same doodling marks on them in one of the desks. And these marks were made by the murderer. Garrick? I arrest you. What's wrong, Dick? He's got a gun. Oh, Oh, Scubby. Pick up the pieces. Oh, boy. There's the murderer, Garrick. He's also the man who tried to murder you and me last night in the road of Burdick's home. Oh, I'll be. You see, Scubby, Burdick has his suspicions about Garrick. That's why we found those securities on him. He took them so that they wouldn't fall into Garrick's hands. He'd suddenly found out that Garrick was an unscrupulous crook. And that was the reason he ran when Mrs. Burdick called him. He saw Garrick at the window and was afraid of him. Well, Nick, I must say he had me fooled when he said that Nelson was standing at the door of the office here when he was really there himself. Yes, in telling us who was in this office, our clever murderer just reversed the positions in which he and Mr. Nelson were standing when the murder was committed. But once I saw the marks on that flyleaf, I knew who stood where. And that's why I had Nelson come up here. To force Garrick's hand. Well, Nick, one way's as good as another as long as you get results. And you always seem to do that. So you finally decided to come back, did you? Yes, Patsy, it's all over. Well, I think you can go home now. Why, Mr. Carter, are you sure you can spare me? Why not? You've been so busy on this case all night, Mr. Carter, you may not have noticed that it is now a new day. And a good secretary is always on the job the first thing in the morning. Shall I take a letter, Mr. Carter? This was another strange experience of Nick Carter, Master Detective, called An Angle on Murder, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Mutilated Bullet. Another of the curious adventures of Nick Carter, which are brought to you by WOR Mutual. And now, Nick, what's next week's story all about? Well, when this case was first brought to me, it seemed so routine and uninteresting that I practically turned it down. But it was far from routine once you got into it, wasn't it, Nick? Yes, indeed. So far from it that 
Yes. I almost got myself bumped off investigating it. It's really the story of a man who thought he was so much cleverer than Nick that he could outwit him every time. I don't suppose he got away with it. No. He found he wasn't really so clever after all. Like practically every criminal I ever met, he gave himself away by being too clever. Well, sounds like an interesting tale, Nick. Not only interesting, but downright exciting. But more of that next week. So long, folks. So long. And so long to you, Nick and Patsy. In the strange adventure you've just heard, Nick Carter was impersonated by Lon Clark, Patsy by Helen Choate, and Scubby by John Kane. The story was written for Nick Carter by George Gordon. Original music was played by Lou White. The entire production was under the direction of Jock McGregor. Next week, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter entitled The Body on the Slab. Or Nick Carter and the Mystery of a Missing Husband. This story is a copyrighted feature of Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Beginning Wednesday, November 3rd, The Return of Nick Carter, which is produced in the studios of WOR, will be broadcast over most of these stations on Wednesday evenings at 8.30 Eastern Wartime. Remember the new time, Wednesdays at 8.30 Eastern Wartime, beginning Wednesday, November 3rd. This is Mutual. another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Tonight's curious adventure, The Body on the Slab, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Missing Husband. But Mrs. Wallace, people disappear every day in a big city like this. Such things are really no concern of mine. They're a matter for the police. But, Mr. Carter, it isn't just anybody who's disappeared. It's my husband. I'll pay you anything to find him. Well, I suppose it can do no harm to listen to the story. All right, Mr. Burnett. Where was the last place you saw him? In a sort of saloon gambling house on West Street, down by the waterfront. A two-story house, a very run down. Wait a minute, Burnett. That wouldn't be the place that's run by a one-legged soldier they call Bill. Oh, so you know it, do you? Certainly do. By reputation, at least. Here. I want you to look at this picture. You recognize it? Yes, that's the place I'm talking about. I thought so. Mrs. Wallace, I'll take the case. Oh, Mr. Carter, I knew you would. Yes, I have a score to settle with that old rat with a wooden leg. And this may be my chance to do it. All right, Mr. Bennett. Let me have all the details. Well, Vernon, that's Vernon Wallace, my friend. Vernon and I have been making a night of it. And we ended up at this Bill's place. How did you happen to go there? Well, Vernon had heard that it was a great place for a fast poker game, and he was determined to try it. I'd heard it was a pretty tough place, and I attempted to talk him out of it, but I couldn't do it. So about 1.30 or 2 o'clock this morning, we went down there. We were the only ones there. To make a long story short, Vernon and that old guy who owns the place got into a game, and no matter what the old guy did, Vernon won. I was afraid for him in a dive like that, and I tried to get him to quit and go home with me, but he refused told me to get out and leave him alone. And Vernon hasn't been home since then. And he, he hasn't been seen anywhere since then. I'm afraid that he... that he never left that place alive. Well, I see. The place to start looking for clues is certainly the old soldier's tavern. I'm going down there tonight. I know enough tricks with cards so that I can be sure of winning. And maybe old Pegleg will try to treat me as he treated Vernon Wallace. <laughs> Well, stranger, I gotta admit I'm lit. You broke the bank. Yes, luck's been with me ever since I sat down here. Well, it's getting late. I've got to be getting home. Uh, how about a drink before you go, stranger? You'll not refuse me that. Why, no, I'll have a drink with you. But only one. Sure, sure, one will be okay. Hey, Mike, two beers and make it snappy. Yeah, coming up. 
You want all my money tonight, stranger, but I don't harbor no ill feelings. Nice of you. You want fair and square, and that's all there is to it. Here's your beers. Uh, here you are, stranger. Drink hearty. Oh, can I see you a minute alone? Sure, my. Uh, excuse me, stranger. I'll be back before you can shake a stick. Oh, that's all right. I'll enjoy my drink while you're gone. Uh, stranger, Mike and I have taken a fancy to you. We don't want no harm to come to you. Look, why don't you stay here all night? Mike's got an extra bed upstairs. He'll be glad to let you have. Then tomorrow you can go home and nobody will bother you. Well, if you let me pay for the use of the room and bed, I believe I will. Stay. Good, you're a smart man. We couldn't take no money for doing you a favor. Uh, Here, Mike, show the gentleman his room. Yeah, sure. Will you follow me, mister? Uh, uh, sure. Go ahead. Uh, I want to get to bed. I'm, I'm tired, all of a sudden. Uh, give me uh, your arm, mister. No, 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 no. I'm all right. I, I don't need any help. Well, I'll come along just. To be sociable. I don't want to be sociable. I just want to go to sleep for this one. Well, here's your room, mister. I'll leave a candle on the table for you. Okay. Okay. Thanks very much. Good night, sir. There you are, stranger. Sleep tight. Yeah. We'll see you later. Yeah. We'll see you later. Yeah, I'll see you later. Good night. Good night. I gotta go to sleep. I'm awful tired. I'm awful tired. <sighs> Well, got myself into this easy enough. Hope I'll find it as easy to get out again when the time comes. Uh, no light, but a candle. Why it'll do to give me a look around. Instead of this bed. Uh, it doesn't look too comfortable. But, oh, blood. Let's see. The man were lying on this bed. That blood is just about where a dagger would go through his heart. The man were drunk enough or had been drugged, you'd never know what hit him. Well, let's look around here. I wonder what's in this closet. Uh-huh. Locked. Well, that won't keep me out long. Not as long as I still have my keys with me. Try this one. No. Ah, this one does it. Well, this is interesting. Old clothes. Here's a vest. With blood on it. And there's a shirt and a jacket. Both of them bloody. Unquestionably, these came from some of the victims. Well, nothing to do now but wait for that one-legged scoundrel and his pal to make the next move. <sighs> well, I guess I'll be safe if I merely sit on the edge of the bed now. Oh, yes, I won't need this candle anymore either. Now to wait for them. He's asleep, all right. I can hear him snoring. Well, with the slug I put in his bed, he'd have to be the sleeper of dead. All right. Easy does it. Is he still asleep? Yeah. You hold this light while I... Get your hands up, both of you. Well, well I'll be... And drop that knife you got in your hand, Bill. How... How can you be awake when we... Really very simple, Bill. Keep those hands up. I just poured that drink you gave me on the floor instead of down my throat. What are you going to do with us? I'm going to turn you over to the police. With the evidence of the bloody clothes in the closet and what other evidence they'll undoubtedly find when they search this place, you both should have an interesting time of it. Why don't you kill us now and be done with it? Because I want some information first. Why should we tell you anything? Because if you do, I shall probably be able to get your sentence reduced somewhat. If you don't... I got you. What do you want to know? Last night, a young man won all your money. He hasn't been seen since. You mean that fellow with a little mustache? I do. Did you murder him the way you tried to murder me? I didn't do nothing with him. Maybe I wanted to, but I didn't. Isn't it a fact that this chap's friend tried to get him to leave you and go home? Yeah. And when he wouldn't go, the friend finally went off without him? No, that's a lie. They left here together. What? You trying to tell me one of them didn't leave before the other? No, they went out together. You know where they went? How should I know? There was a taxi waiting right outside the door here. Seemed to be waiting for them to come out. Then the guy with the money gets inside, and his friend sits in front with the driver. Oh, his friend sat in front with the driver, huh? But you know that cab, if you saw it again. Sure, it had a big dent in the back of the body. Painted with red lead. I've seen him around this part of the city before. I see. 
Well, Bill, as soon as I can turn you and your pal over to the law, I'll have Penny find that taxi with a dent in the back. Trail seems to lead direct to him. Nick Carter's office. Oh, hello, Patsy. Is Penny there yet? Penny? Who's Penny? Oh, I forgot, Patsy. You were away yesterday when all this happened. Scubby got a rush assignment to cover the Balkan campaign for his paper and had to leave in a boat to let sail last night. Scubby gone without saying goodbye to me? We couldn't, Patsy. You weren't here. He asked me to do it for him. Oh, Nick, I'm going to miss Scubby. Of course, Patsy. We'll both miss him. But while he's away, I'm having Penny Eagles work on my cases with me in Scubby's place. Who's this Penny Eagles? I never heard of him. Oh, he's an old friend of mine. Very clever fellow. When he was younger, he was an expert forger. How did you happen to get mixed up with him? Well, he was accused of a murder he had nothing to do with. And he had me get clear. Then he got interested in law enforcement, turned over a new leaf, and has gone straight ever since. You like him, Patsy? I hope so. Well, he should be in a minute now. As soon as he shows up, have him call me at Shermore 31222. Shermore 31222. Right. I'll wait here for his call. You're right, Penny That's the taxi we're looking for And I know that driver You do? Yes John Hagen, ex-convict and confidence man Friend of yours? Hardly Seen him in court several times, but he's never seen me What's he been doing since you've been watching him? Well, all afternoon and the early part of this evening He's acted like any other cabbie Taking whatever fares he could get but the latter part of the evening, he's been fussy about who rides in his cab. How do you mean? Well, I've seen several parties try to take his cab. But all he's picked up in the last two hours were two drunks, and oh, were they pie-eyed. I see. I think I know what he's looking for, Penny. And I'm going to give him just the kind of a passenger I think he wants. Wish me luck. But, Nick, what are you going to do? Well, so long, old fellow. i got to be getting home now. I'll see you tomorrow, maybe, huh? Okay. So long, but don't take any wooden nickels. Okay, pal, that's right. Don't take a wooden nickel. <laughs> I, I had to hey, taxi, mister? Taxi? Taxi, hey, mister? What do I want a taxi for? I got a well, car a my own. A friend of yours I... told me to come for you and take you home. Oh, a friend of mine. Yeah. Oh, well, I saw it. It's okay. Where's the, where's the door? I can't find it. Hey, what's the address, mister? Uh, the address? It's um, the, the, the corner of 2nd and 5th. And don't bother me anymore, bud. I got to get me some sleep. Okay. Yes, I want McDuff. Now, I'll wager it won't be towards second and fifth. Wait a minute. What's that smell? Perfume? I know. That's ether. So that's the stunt. Picks up drunks who are too far gone to know what's happening, then doses them with just enough ether to put them soundly asleep. Well, it won't happen to me. If I open one of these windows a little bit, that'll keep the air clear. There. Now, Mr. Hagen, the next move is up to you. Certainly plenty deserted, way out here. Wonder how much further we're going. I better get this window shut again so he won't suspect anything. Ah, so we're near the end of our journey, huh? Very well, Mr. Hagen. I'm ready for you. <laughs> Sleeping like a babe, ain't you? Well, let's see what you got in your pockets, then I'll dump Make you a up. move, Hagen, and hey. I'll blow your brains out. What the... Who the deuce are you? I'm a detective. See this? Oh. Well, what you want with me? I wanted to find out what your scheme was, and I found out. Now I want you to tell me about the man you picked up at Peg Lake Bill's Tavern down on West Street last night about 3 o'clock. And I... I don't know nothing about it. Oh, no? Look, you waited for him outside of Bill's place. He rode in back, and his companion rode up front with you. During the ride, you gave him ether through that devilish device you rigged up in this taxi of yours and made him unconscious. Yeah, if you... If you know all that, why do you ask me, huh? Because there are two things I don't know. And if you want to avoid further trouble, my friend, you'll tell me. Now, first, who was the man who rode up front with you? I don't know. No? No. Ah, oh, well, uh, I've done a few odd jobs for him in the past, but... Well, I don't know his name. They, they call him the captain. 
He made a deal with me early last night to be outside of Bill's place uh, about 2.30 this morning. Can you describe him? He's sort of an ordinary guy. About my size, maybe. Well, he's kind of good looking. If he, if he didn't have a hunk out of one ear. Burnett. Now, what did you do with the man who was in the back? Well, after I quieted him, we took him to a friend of the captain's, other side of town. What was the address to which you took the body? Hey, there wasn't no body. He's just as alive as you or me. Now well, he took him to a 14 Wanton place. Left him there. All right. Get back in your cab and drive me to second and fifth. Then I'm through with you, unless you've lied to me. You have, keep out of my way. Or you'll go to jail for life. This is where Mrs. Wallace lives, Patsy. Well, I hope she's home. But, Nick, what do you expect to find out here? I don't know, Patsy. The thing that puzzles me about this case is why Burnett wanted to do away with Wallace. The bell, will you? Mm -hmm. It wasn't the money that Wallace won that tempted Burnett. As he could have taken that while Wallace was unconscious. Now there's a stronger reason. And you hope Mrs. Wallace can throw some light on it. I hope so, Betsy. If she can only help me that way. Oh, hello, Mr. Carter. Won't you come in? Thank you, Mrs. Wallace. May I present my assistant, Patsy Bowen? How do you do, Miss Bowen? Hello, Mrs. Wallace. Please sit down. Thank you. Thank you. Tell me, Mr. Carter, have you found out anything about my husband? Well, nothing definite, I'm sorry to say. We have learned, though, that he fell into bad hands. But we don't know what happened to him after that. Oh, Arthur assured me you'd find out the truth if anyone could. Arthur? Oh, you mean Mr. Burnett. Yes. Yes, he's been so kind to me. He's done so much to cheer me up. Well, except for his kindness, I'd have gone crazy. You've known him long, Mrs. Wallace? All my life. We were brought up together. And then, too, he and my husband have been business partners for, oh, the best of friends for years. You think a great deal of him, then? Yes, indeed. Mr. Carter, at one time before I met Vernon, I would have married him if he'd asked me. Then I met Vernon and really fell in love with him. But even after I married Vernon, Arthur continued to be my best friend. I think very highly of him. You're lucky to have such a friend, Mrs. Wallace. But he could never take my husband's place. You must find Vernon, Mr. Carter. If it's possible to find him, Nick will do it. Yes, Mrs. Wallace. You may rely on me for that. Well, shall we be running along now, Patsy? <laughs> Why did you say you're calling from Penny? I'm at a pay station near the house where Hagen left Wallace that night. It's owned by a queer old character they call the Weasel. He works in a crematory about a mile down the road. I see. Well, Hagen's story seems to be straight enough. A couple of guys in a saloon near here says they saw the Weasel and another guy carrying a man-sized bundle into the Weasel's place about daybreak a couple of mornings ago. And it hasn't come out again, as far as I can find out. Well, did you learn anything about the firm of Wallace and Burnett? Yeah, you know, yeah, I picked up a lot of rumors, Nick, but not many things. Here's how it goes. Burnett ruins the firm and throws the blame on Wallace. And those who know don't think that Burnett lost much money when the firm failed, but Wallace did. So I was right. What else? Well, Burnett was the one who started Wallace gambling and drinking. Wallace is a nice guy, but he seems to be the weak sister. But nobody seems to know what Burnett's got against him. And by putting together what Mrs. Wallace told us and what you've learned, Penny, I think I begin to see the answer. I think that... Hold it, Nick. The guy who looks like Burnett is going into the weasel's place. Good. Don't let him get away from you, Penny. I'll meet you there as soon as I can. Yep. You're right. You're right, Nick. They did bring that casket here to the crematory. I thought they would. But I wish I could get closer and see what they did with it after they carried it inside. Look, Nick. That window over there is open a little. Huh? Maybe we could hear something from there. Good idea, Penny. Come on. But quiet. Yeah. But, Weasel, are you sure they won't be suspicious? Not a chance, Captain. That's why we're doing this tonight. The owners of the crematory are going to make a test of a new heating fixture tomorrow morning. And they told me to have the ovens hot by 10 o'clock. I'm just getting them hot a little ahead of time. Uh, what do you use when you... Make a test like that. Well, he sent me the body of a dead calf. It's over there in the closet. Yeah, but the test we're going to make tonight will be even better, eh, Captain? Yes. How does this thing work? Oh, simple. The body's laid here on this slab and strapped down the way you saw me fix this fella. In the next room, there's a lever attached to the slab. When the lever's pulled, the slab slides into the oven. The door closes behind it, and the destruction of the body... 
begin. Do we have to... to watch it burn? You can't see the slab nor the ovens from the room where the lever is. How long does it take to reduce the body to ashes? Six or eight hours. It'll be all over by daylight. Even if the body isn't... You mean uh, even if the body ain't dead yet? Yes, that's what I mean. And Wallace is still alive. Well, it's a little unusual to cremate a live body, but it works just the same. You'll never know what happened. It'll be all over in an instant. Well, we got nothing more to do here. Might as well go in the next room and wait for the ovens to get hot enough. Uh, then you can pull the lever and slide the body. You mean I have to pull the lever that sends him into... Sure. He's your friend, Eddie. Come on, Penny. There's no time to waste. We have to work fast. Mr. Burnett, to see you, Nick. Oh, yes. Come in, Mr. Burnett. I just want to take enough of your time to tell you that Vernon Wallace's body was found last night. Really? Where was it? Floating in the river. Mrs. Wallace has identified it by a ring and... Certain other articles found on the body. Oh, must have been a terrible blow to her. She's badly broken up, naturally. But I hope to be able to console her, in part at least, for her great loss. I'm sure you will. Uh, will this repay you for your trouble? Oh, amply, Mr. Burnett. And thank you. Good. Good day, Mr. Carter. Good day, Mr. Burnett. But if you think I'm going to drop this case now, Mr. Burnett, you're crazy. <laughs> Here I am, over here. I got here as soon as I could after I got your call, Penny. Brought my new helper, too, as you see. Yeah, so I see. Hi there, helper. Hello, Penny. I hope I'm going to be able to help you and Nick. You'll do all right on this case. Now, what's the dope, Penny? Well, a couple of hours ago, a taxi pulls up in front of Mrs. Wallace's house. Mm -hmm. The driver goes into the house. About 15 minutes later, he comes out again with Mrs. Wallace and her maid. They get in the cab... Drive away. With you after him, of course. That's right. Well, they drive around and finally end up way out here. There must have been a couple of guys in the cab when the women got in. Because when they got out there, they were both gagged and their hands were tied behind them. Well, they took him in the old house. I found a phone to call you. Did they hurt them? Well, not so far as I could tell. Gee, I wish I could see what they're doing now. I hope they're all right. Oh, Millie, this is terrible. <laughs> My mouth is still sore from that dirty old cloth they used for a gag. Where do you suppose we are? Oh, I don't know, Mrs. Wallace. I, I've never been this far from town before. Could you see anything out of the window? Oh, nothing I recognize. Oh, I should have known better than to be fooled by such a simple trick. I might have known that old Mrs. Parker couldn't be so sick she had to see us at once. Why, so only the day before yesterday. No, fool me, all right. I thought... I hope uh, you're comfortable, ladies. We are not. We certainly are not. What's the idea of bringing us here? Well, I'll tell you. The cap says as how he's going to collect some big dough from you two. You mean we're being held for ransom? Yep. Well, how much money do you want? Well, the cap says he won't take less than fifty. $50,000. Oh, Mrs. Wallace, we'll never get out of here. Nonsense. <laughs> he must be insane to expect me to pay him that amount of money. Well, he says he won't take a cent less. Well, he won't get it. Never. And he's a dangerous man. You better not get him mad at you. I'll be back at 8 o'clock tonight for your answer. Oh, he'll kill us. I know he will. Be quiet, Millie. He won't kill us as long as he thinks there's any chance of getting the money out of us. But what if we get... A man at the window. It's Mr. Burnett. Oh, Arthur. Arthur, I hoped you'd come. Are you... Are you safe, Louise? Have they hurt you? No, Arthur. We're both safe. But how did you ever find us? I just climbed up the porch to the roof, then over to your window. Well, Have they told you why they brought you here? Yes, they want ransom. Fifty thousand dollars. They'll kill us if you don't save us. Not while I'm here. I'll see that no harm comes to you. But what can you do? You're only one against the two of them, and, and they're both vicious criminals, I know. Do be careful, Arthur. Louise, if I save you from these rats, do you think that you... Ask me later, Arthur. Not now, please. Very well, if you say so. 
Now, tell me, what time are the men coming back again? Do you know? The man we talked to said they'd be here at 8 o'clock. That gives us just over an hour. Now, here's my plan. When they come, I'll be here. Now, you each know what you're supposed to do, don't you? Sure, Nicky, sure. You know, this ought to be fun. I haven't played cops and robbers since I was a kid. Same here. This should be good. Well, I hope you two aren't disappointed. But you can't tell about these things. So watch your step, both of you. Here they are. Leave everything to me. Well, you made up your mind to pay the ransom the cab wants? We'll pay you nothing. Not a cent. You know what that means, don't you? It means that you better get your hands up, all three of you, if you want to live. Who are you? I'm here to save these two ladies from you and your gang. Oh, yeah? Let him have it, fella. Oh, I warned you. Ah. Arthur, you've killed them all. It's their own fault. I warned them. Oh, you were wonderful, Arthur. Oh, Arthur, are you hurt? No, Louise, dear. Fortune was with me. I'm not even scratched. Oh, Mr. Brunetta. I never in my whole life saw anyone so brave as you. Any man would be brave when defending the woman he loves. Please, Arthur, you promised. I'm sorry. I'll take you home now. Just let me drag these bodies out of the way and I'll... Not yet, you won't. Wait, you can't. <laughs> What's the matter with you men? What's the idea of... Shut up, you. Arthur, are you hurt? Mrs. Wallace... The time has come to explain a great many things. First, let me remove this beard. There. You recognize me now, don't you? Mr. Carter! Nick Carter! Oh, Mr. Carter, what are you doing to Arthur? Mr. Burnett? I'll answer that later. First, I want you to meet my assistant, Penny Eagles. Your assistant? Sure. How are you? The other man is an old friend of yours, Mrs. Wallace. An old friend of mine? Mm-hmm. Why, well, I'm sure I don't or perhaps know. if he took off his makeup, you might recognize him. There. Do you know me now? Vernon! Oh, Vernon. Oh, Louise, my darling. But Vernon, Arthur told me that you... That I was dead? Oh, yes. Arthur Burnett told you a great many things that were not true. But Vernon, he showed me your ring, your lodge pin. He, he said he took them off of your dead body that the police found in the river. Burnett took those articles from your husband's body right enough, Mrs. Wallace. But it was while your husband was still alive. And it's no fault of his that I'm not dead now. You don't mean that Arthur... That's Arthur... exactly what I do mean. He's been lying to you for years, Mrs. Wallace. It was he who ruined your husband's business and caused him to lose so much of his money. It was he who first induced your husband to drink and gamble. And it was he who was responsible for your husband's disappearance a few days ago. That's a lie. Oh, no, it isn't. As a matter of fact, Louise, dear, if Mr. Carter hadn't fooled him by putting a dead calf in my place on that crematory slab, Arthur Burnett would have been my murderer. Oh, no. No, that can't be true. Uh, Furthermore, it was Burnett who arranged for your kidnapping this afternoon. Oh, but... He did it so that he could suddenly appear and rescue you from the members of the kidnap gang, who in reality men in his employ. But why should he do all these horrible things? Because he's been in love with you ever since he first met you. And ever since your marriage to Wallace, he's been insanely jealous of him. Everything Burnett's done has been to make you despise your husband and turn instead to him. That's a lie, Carter. Oh, no, it isn't, Burnett. I can easily prove it. Penny, let me have the gun with this Burnett shot us during the battle a few minutes ago. Sure, Nick. Here you are. Thanks. Now look here, Mrs. Wallace. This pistol has eight shells in it. Burnett fired five shots at us, but there are still three shells left. And here they are. Why, those are blanks. They couldn't hurt anybody. Exactly, Mrs. Wallace. And the shells and the pistols that his men were to use in the fights were blanks also. And if I were a beautiful woman in distress and a man came to my rescue with his pistol loaded with blanks, I think I should find it extremely difficult to believe that he was being on the level with me. That was another strange experience of Nick Carter, Master Detective, called The Body on the Slab, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Missing Husband... Another of the curious adventures of Nick Carter, which are brought to you regularly at the same time by WOR Mutual. And now, Nick, how about a few hints on next week's story? It's a story of a body which was washed up on the beach, tied up in a sack. And the only identifying mark on the body was one of Nick's cards. I had to solve that murder to prove I didn't do it myself. And I found that the real culprit was the killer who used a clue that pointed directly to him. 
to prove that he couldn't have done it. And the killer tried to drown both Nick and myself when the chase got too warm for comfort. But as you can easily see, he didn't succeed. So, so long until next week. So long, folks. And so long to you and Nick for now, Patsy. In the strange adventure you have just heard, Nick Carter was impersonated by Lon Clark, Patsy by Helen Choate. Original music was played by Lou White. The entire production was written and directed by Jock McGregor. Next week at the same time, listen to another curious adventure of Nick Carter entitled The Drug Ring Murder. For Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Left Handed Killer. This story is a copyrighted feature of Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. The Return of Nick Carter is produced in the studios of WOR and is broadcast over most of these stations every Wednesday evening at 8.30 Eastern War Time. This is Mutual. What's the matter? What is it? Another case for Nick Carter, Master Detective. Yes, it's another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Tonight's curious adventure, The Drug Ring Murder, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Left-Handed Killer. Well, Mr. Nicholas Carter, are you going to answer your telephone, or are you going to take me out to lunch, as you promised? There's no reason why I can't do both, Patsy. Nick Carter speaking. Nick, this is Riley at headquarters. Oh, how are you, Lieutenant? There goes my It's on your mind. Murder. And you're right in the middle of it, Nick. Meet me at the city morgue as quick as you can. I'm waiting here. What's the matter, Riley? Can't headquarters solve this case without me? Who said anything about your solving the case? You get yourself down to the morgue right away, and that's an order. An order, Riley? What are you talking about? The body of a man was washed up on the beach this morning, only he didn't die from drowning. It was murder. Yes? There was no identification on the body. None at all. Except one of your business cards. Nick Carter, private detective. What? I hid the card in my pocket as soon as I laid eyes on it. But there's a chance one of the reporters saw it before I did. Now, do I have to draw your diagram? You've already done it. I'll be there in the double rally. Bye. What's up, Nick? Plenty. Look, Patsy, hold on the office until you hear from me. I'll call you within an hour. I knew you shouldn't have answered that phone. Business before pleasure, Patsy. And right now, I've got business at the city morgue. Where have you got him, Riley? On a slab out here? Uh, He's on ice. In the box at the end of the room there. And I'm telling you one thing, Nick Carter. It's lucky for you that I was here when he was brought in. Now, look, Riley. Surely you aren't trying to pull me into this thing just because the fellow was carrying one of my cars. Uh, Well, there's probably hundreds of people I never heard of are carrying my name in their vest pockets. Well, if you'd rather be explaining to the captain how your car got on a corpse... Oh, now, take it easy, Riley. You know what it means for an officer of the law to conceal evidence, Nick. How do I know one of those reporters or photographers isn't telling the captain right now that... Let's worry about one thing at a time. You said the body was washed up on the beach on the north shore of Long Island? Yes, it was. Stuffed in a gunny sack with every bit of identification removed. Hmm. Everything was ripped out except a concealed pocket. Yes, I know. With my card in it. Yes. Now, here we are. Last box here. Now, take a good look, Nick. Well, did you ever see him before? Oh, yes. That's Stanley Phillips. Huh? Dr. Stanley Phillips. He's a research chemist. Sort of an eccentric. Oh, oh, balmy, huh? No, no, just strange. He's assisted me in a few investigations. But for the most part, he was pretty much of a hermit. Didn't like to mix with people. Yeah, that don't make sense. People who mind their own business don't get and go around getting themselves murdered. Where did he live? There's a big house on a Long Island Sound, but his laboratory was on his yacht. It was anchored about half a mile or so up in the house, if I remember correctly. Laboratory on a yacht? Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, he was balmy. Hey, Riley, look. Here in his neck. What did you expect? I told you he was strangled. The autopsy showed he was dead before he was put into the gunny sack and thrown into the water. I know, but that isn't what I mean. Here, 
Look at the prints in his neck. Closely, look at them. Yeah, yeah, well, lest I miss my guess, Riley, he was murdered by a left-handed killer. Say, maybe you've got something there, Nick. I'll phone the fingerprint expert. Now, wait a minute, Riley. Let me hit the phone first. got to be in my way. Hey, now, now, don't be forgetting you can't take long on this, Nick. The captain will be wanting to question you about your card being found on the body. I can't hold off more than a few hours. Give me those few hours, Riley, and I'll wrap the murderer up in wax paper. Nicholas Carter's office. Oh, hello, Patsy. I, we got work to do. Yes, Nick? I want you to go through the files and dig out all the stuff we have on Dr. Stanley Phillips. That queer duck who did some work for you once? Yeah, that's the one. Research chemist. Uh-huh. Get all the dope on him and meet me down in front of the office in ten minutes. I'll pick you up. All right, Nick. That's all. Yeah, where are you headed for, Nick? The Phillips Estate on Long Island Sound. Meet me there as soon as you get the report on the fingerprints and Stanley Phillips' neck. <laughs> Apparently, neither he nor his sister ever married. After the parents died, they continued to live in the big manor house. What did you say the sister's name was? Rose Phillips. Rose. Go on. Mm, you know all about his laboratory being on his yacht. Mm-hmm. It's supposed to be one of the best private laboratories in the country. Used to do a lot of research work for big companies. That's a laboratory assistant, Tom Marks, young man. And let's see what else. Um... Oh, his hobby was writing. Scientific articles they were. Usually about the effects of habit-forming drugs. He had an article in Popular Research last month entitled Morphine Exposed. So he wrote about habit-forming drugs, huh? Hmm. You know, Patsy, this case might turn out to be more than just an ordinary murder. I guess nobody's home, Nick. You're wrong about that, Betsy. Saw the curtains at the window move. Hmm. Pounding on the door isn't going to do any good either. Whoever's in there evidently doesn't want callers today. However... What are you going to do? Open the door. This little lock picker of mine. There it is. All right, come on, Betsy. We're going in. I don't see anybody. Stay behind me. Put your hands up. Over your head. She's got a gun, Nick. You're Rose Phillips, I take it, miss? Keep your hands up. I'm asking the questions. Who are you? I'm Nick Carter, and this is... Nick Carter? Yes. And this is my assistant, Patsy Bone. Nick Carter, the great detective, when my brother often speaks of you, he thinks you're wonderful. Nick, she doesn't know yet. Miss Phillips, I'm sorry to have to tell you like this, but your brother is dead. Dead? Yes. <laughs> I'm afraid he was murdered. <laughs> murdered. Stanley murdered. <laughs> now, if you'll just put that gun away, Miss Phillips, we'll talk things over. Good, Mr. Carter, I'm sorry. This is all such a shock. It was a fiendish killing. And I'm going to do all I can to bring the criminal to justice. You may be sure of that. Oh, Rose. Rose. I'm in here, Richard. Oh. Well, uh... Who are these people? I thought Stanley told you never to let strangers in the house. It's all right, Richard. This is Nick Carter, the detective, and his assistant. Oh, well, well, that's different. How do you do, Mr. Carter? I'm Richard Coles. I take it you've already heard about Dr. Phillips. Yes. Ghastly, isn't it? I can hardly believe it. The police say it was murder. For the life of me, I can't imagine who would want to murder Stanley. He was a strange man, Mr. Carter, very strange. He had a phobia about not letting anyone in the house when he was away. You seem to manage an entrance all right, Mr. Coles. Well, I... Mr. Coles is a very old friend of the family and has always had a key to the house. He's our lawyer. Look out, Nick! There's someone at the window! He's got a gun! I can't get over it, Nick. You don't seem to be surprised that you were shot at back there in the house. I'm not, Patsy. That's why I was standing beside that suit of armor. That protected me by deflecting the bullets. Nick, your presence on the Phillips case is most annoying to someone. Too bad that window was frosted glass. Mm. Couldn't get a look at the gunman. That tiny crack the window was open. Well, now, did you find what I told you to look for in the cottage occupied by Tom Marks, the lab assistant? Yes, I found a pair of his gloves. Good. I had to go through all his desk drawers to find them, too. Let me see them. Mm-hmm. All seems to be adding up. Almost too neatly. Adds up to a pair of gloves. That's all. Look, Patsy. 
Coles told me back there's something about the terms of Philip's will. If he lived to be 50, his estate was to go to a foundation. If he died before that, Rose was to inherit all the estate. But that makes Rose the... Oh, no, 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 no. I don't suspect Rose. Her grief seemed genuine. But there's something else I learned. Tom Marks, Philip's lab assistant, in love with Rose. They've been wanting to get married, but Philip's opposed the marriage. Now the field is clear. With oodles of money to boot. But that still doesn't make Tom Marks... Betsy, the... I'm almost certain Phillips was strangled by a left-handed killer. These gloves of Marks you brought me show that he's left-handed. Oh. And that leads us where? Right out to the laboratory in the yacht. I've got to find Tom Marks. <laughs> Nick, why in the world do you suppose Dr. Phillips had his laboratory way out here in the middle of the sound? There's no mystery to that one, Patsy. He told me why once. Well, why? So people couldn't bother him. I'd have used his technical knowledge a lot more often on cases myself if it had been more accessible. Well, here we are. This is the Phillips yacht. I'll tie up here. I've never climbed up a rope ladder before. And you're not going up now either. Not until I look around the boat myself. Oh, Nick, am I helping you on this case or not? You are, but I don't want you taking unnecessary chances. Nick, please. Now, quiet a minute, Patsy. Let's see if we can raise somebody from here. Hello, up there. Hello, aboard the Phillips yacht. It's funny. Tom Marks is aboard. He's keeping quiet about it. Well, we'll find out right now. You better stay here in the motorboat. And let you solve this case alone? Not a chance. Okay, okay. But stay directly behind me, remember? Phew. Climbing this rope ladder's no cinch. I'm glad I'm not a sailor. Can you make it? Uh-huh. I'm coming. What do you think you'll find, Nick? Tom Marks, I hope. Here. Here. Let me give you a hand over the rail. All right. Oops, it is. Oh, thanks. Well, there's nobody to lay out the welcome rug on the deck of this floating laboratory. Well, that doesn't mean we're alone, Patsy. Come on. We're going down this companionway. Okay. If I'm not mistaken, it leads to Phillips' laboratory. Mm-hmm. This is the laboratory. All right, Patsy, stay behind me. I'm going to open the door. Hey, Marks. Tom Marks, you in there? All right, Patsy. We can go in. Well, Tom Marks seems to have vanished, but he certainly left a mess behind him. Yes. Overturned retorts. Bunsen burner knocked over. Hmm, look here on the floor. Hmm, broken bottle. Sulfuric acid spilled and eating into the floor. Yes, this is where Dr. Stanley Phillips met his death, all right. And when the killer came at him, he was sitting at this desk writing. Well, how do you figure that? That bottle of ink tipped over. wonder if he has any papers here that'll tell us what we want to know. No. Desk been rifled. Everything of any value has already been taken. Well, it still all adds up to Tom Marks, doesn't it? Yep, seems to. We'll know for sure as soon as Riley gets the report from the fingerprint expert. Nick! Hmm? Nick, come here. Look what I found in the sink. What? This piece of paper. I see. Now, that's in Dr. Phillips' handwriting. Well, somebody tried to burn it out. Then they threw it on the drain board of the sink here. Part of it didn't burn. Let's see if I can figure it out. Like you to know, the man whom I have trusted and worked with these many years is, I have discovered, the head of a giant dope peddling ring. Been using my premises to carry on his business. This man is... Nick, the lights have gone off! <laughs> oh... Patsy. Mm. Patsy, where are you? Patsy. Nick. You all right, Patsy? Uh, my head. Somebody hit me. Stay where you are, I'll find the switch. Do you have your flashlight? Yeah, I'll find the switch in just a second. Oh, the lights won't work. Uh. They must have been turned off the master switch in the engine room. And that means there's more than one person on this boat besides us. One of them turned off the lights and the other one shot at us in here. Are you were right when you said you felt everything wasn't okay on this yacht. You able to get up, Patsy? Oh, sure. I'm all right now. Just a big hen's egg on my head, that's all. Okay. Come on. Nick, did they take the note? It's just what I want to find out. Let's see. A flash of light down in the sink. Yeah, it's gone. Hey, but wait. What are you going to do? Clean up the sink a little. Ashes don't look well scattered around in a white sink. Carefully now. 
No, but... Ah, there we are. Now we're ready. Ready for what? To search this yacht from stem to stern. What in blazes has been keeping you, Nick? I've been cooling my heels on this dock for the past half hour here. I hope you'll be here, Riley. Hello, Lieutenant. Hello, Patsy. You see, you look as if you'd seen a ghost on that yacht. I did. Somebody took a shot at us in the dock. What? Patsy got knocked down the freighters and got a nasty bump in her head. Say, who did it, Nick? Whoever it was made a neat getaway. Patsy and I searched the ship afterwards from end to end, but didn't find a soul. Did you see anybody coming in from the yacht, Lieutenant? Oh, nary a soul's come in off that boat since I've been here. In fact, the only two people who've been near here was two fishermen. Are you sure they were fishermen? Am I sure? Now, now look, Nick, don't be giving me that. It was bona fide fishermen, all right. They pulled their little rowboat to shore a ways down the beach, and I saw them bring in their catch. And a nice string of fish it was. Okay, okay, Riley. So they were really fishermen. Well, what about your report, Lieutenant? Oh, oh, that. Well, Nick was right. Our fingerprint expert examined the marks on Dr. Phillips' neck and said he was undoubtedly strangled by a left-handed killer. And now all we've got to do is find a left-handed man who had a reason to murder the doctor. We found him. Uh, well, what's that? Dr. Phillips' laboratory assistant, Tom March, is left-handed. You see, you sure worked fast, Nick. And it's a good thing, too. The captain found out about your card being found on the body. Hey, w- what kind of a scoundrel is this, Tom Marks? I don't know. Haven't seen him yet. Wasn't at his cottage, and he wasn't in the lab in the yacht. Now let's make tracks, Mr. Private Detective, and search the grounds here. Wait a minute, Maybe Riley, we... wait a minute. There's one thing more you ought to know. Huh? Whoever killed Dr. Stanley Phillips is the head of a giant dope ring. Duh. Phillips was killed because he was about to expose the man. Hey, that would be the laboratory assistant. He'd have access to drugs. Mr. Carter! Mr. Carter! Uh, who in tarnation is that? Richard Coles, close friend of the Phillips and also the lawyer. Oh. O'Reilly, yeah? put this envelope in your pocket. Careful of it. It's a piece of evidence I picked up in the boat. Okay, Nick. Mr. Carter. Mr. Carter, I've been hunting everywhere for you. Oh, Mr. Coles, this is Lieutenant Riley from headquarters. Oh, I'm yeah. glad you're here, Lieutenant. We're up against a dangerous criminal. Uh, don't worry, Mr. Coles. The law always gets its man. What do you want to see me about, Mr. Coles? Rose Phillips. She's gone. Go- gone? How do you know? Come up to the house with me. I'll show you. Something has happened to her, I'm sure. Hurry! Here. This is Rose's bedroom, Lieutenant. Well... Somebody was making a fast getaway, all right. Yes. Just look at the room. Clothes strewn all over. One of her suitcases is gone, and this suitcase, half-packed, was left behind. She and the laboratory assistant must have been in on this together. If she wasn't guilty, she wouldn't have run away. Oh, she must have been out of her mind. Of course, Rose was in love with Tom, and... Nick. What's the matter, Patsy? What are you frowning at? Rose Phillips didn't run away. Uh, what, what, didn't run away? What are you saying, Patsy? No girl would run away voluntarily and leave all her makeup behind. Well, look at that dressing table. Nothing's been touched. You're right, Patsy. Say, do you suppose... Oh, no, no. What is it, Mr. Coles? Do you suppose that Tom could have forced her to leave? You mean... You mean kidnapping? Yes. Well, he won't get away with it. I'll call headquarters and have a cordon thrown around this entire district. We'll catch Tom Marks before he gets to the next town. Good idea, Riley. Do that. Well, Mr. Cole? Yes, Mr. Carter? I guess Lieutenant Riley has his case all sewed up. His men will have Tom Marks and Rose Phillips within the hour. Well, Mr. Carter, it was nice of you to take such an interest in my friend's death. Um, would you care for a cigarette? Oh, no, thanks. Uh... You, Lieutenant? Why, why, sure, sure, I don't mind if I do. Of course. Uh, light? Yeah, thanks, thanks. Well, good day, Mr. Coles. Goodbye. All right. Come along, Patsy. Hey, uh, where's the telephone, Mr. Coles? There's uh, one right over here on the table. Hurry up, Patsy, we got work to do. I thought you said the case was finished. Not by a long shot. I said that for their benefit. You and I are going over this estate with a fine-tooth comb. I'm not satisfied yet. <laughs> You see anything, Nick? Come on in. Shut the door. Do you think anyone saw us headed for this boathouse? I hope not. Oh, be careful here. Don't step off in the water. Nick, there's a small speedboat in the water. 
Wouldn't you think they'd put it in dry dock so late in the season? Depends, Patsy. Look up there, mounted in the bow. A machine gun? Mm Mm-hmm. This boat was used for business. Gee, who'd ever think a quiet little chemist like Dr. Phillips kept a mounted machine gun on a speedboat? I believe this setup down here was news to Dr. Phillips, too. Hold on to my arm. We'll look around. Oh, Nick, don't step on the fish. String of fish, huh? Well, the... Nick! Those fishermen Riley saw must have come in here. Patsy, this catch isn't fresh. What? Those men used the string of dead fish just to fool Riley. And those were the men who made trouble for us on the yacht. Yeah, they must have been. Well, plenty of life preservers stacked up in here. Yeah, that's strange. Here, yeah, Patsy, hmm? take the flashlight and play it on this one. Okay. Well, what are you doing, taking it to pieces? No, just examining it. Aha! There we have it. What? A small waterproof pocket's been sewn in here. Yes, and it extends all the way around inside this life preserver. Pretty clever. Look, Patsy. What is it? These secret compartments are filled with dope. But every one of these life preservers is filled with drugs. Nobody would ever think of looking in a life preserver for evidence. I think Dr. Phillips did. And that's why he was murdered. Are you okay, Patsy? Yes, but I can't stop crying. Well, that's not surprising. Somebody threw a tear gas bomb through the window. Oh. That's right, friends. It was tear gas. Who's there? (laughs) Pretty clever of me using the tools of my trade that way, isn't it, Mr. Carter? But Tom Marks is always clever. So you're Tom Marks, huh? I've been waiting to set my eyes on you. It's too bad your eyes are filled with tear gas. Because now you'll never have that pleasure. Okay, Pete. Come in and get the lady. Right. I'll take care of Mr. Carter myself. Hey, hey, come on, hey, come on, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let her go along, here. Let her go along. <laughs> Got those iron weights in the bag, Pete? Sure, both of them. This guy will never be washed up on a beach like the doc was. <laughs> good. See you tied a bag good and tight. You know, I think he's passed out. He ain't moving none. I did a job on him before we put him in the bag. <laughs> <laughs> uh, listen to that dame, will you? <laughs> Sounds like a hoot owl with a cold in the head. <laughs> Shut up. Oh, no. Oh, tighten the gag, Pete. Okay. <laughs> That'll do it. Hey. Say, Carter ain't dead. What does it take to kill that guy? I choked him like a rat and he's still talking. All right. All right. Speak your piece, Mr. Carter, because you don't have much longer. You're not going to get away with this. <laughs> you hear what he said? I'm telling you. <laughs> I doubt it, Mr. Carter. You're going straight down to Davy Jones' locker. You'll pay for this. I'll have you behind bars within 24 hours. Oh, listen to him. What do you fellas think you're going to do with Patsy Bone? He's worrying about a dame when he's going to lose his own neck. <laughs> Go easy with her, I'm warning you. I'm Come right. on, let's get rid of him. Okay. It's dark enough now. All right. You got him? Yeah. All right, All lift right. him up. That's it. I'll Not get you one, fellas for this. Two, three, let her go. Hey. I came as soon as I got your flashlight signal from the shore, Nick. You think the criminals are aboard the yacht here now? You'll see in a minute. The laboratory's right down this companionway. Hey, you're dripping wet from head to foot, Nick. What happened? And they tried to pull the same trick on Nick that they pulled on Dr. Phillips. Ah. Only it didn't work, because Nick can expand his neck and wrist muscles. Yes, I had my hands free before I hit the water. There was no trick at all to cut my way out of the sack. And then I clung to the back of their motorboat until it reached the yacht here. I waited for the would-be killers to get aboard, untied Patsy, and here we are. Ah, you're lucky, Nick. He's smart, that's all. Quiet. This is the door. Keep your gun ready. Right. Good evening, Mr. Coles. What? Oh, Nick Carter. Well, come in, Mr. Carter. These two friends of mine and myself were just discussing whether you had found the criminals. I think we have, Mr. Coles. Good, good. There's just one thing more I need to make sure I have the criminals. Riley. Yeah? Give me that envelope I asked you to keep for me. Oh, sure, sure, Nick. Uh, Here you are. Thanks. 
Now, I'll just take the piece of burned paper out of this envelope. Well, are those the pieces you gathered from the drain board? Yes, Betsy. Uh-huh. They were from the note Stanley Phillips wrote just before he was murdered. Now, I'll just use some of these chemicals in the burned paper. Oh. You see, gentlemen, even though this piece of paper's been burned, it is possible by using the correct chemical solution to bring out the writing that was on the paper before it was burned. In this case, I expect the writing will give the name of the man Phillips designated as head of the giant drug ring. And... Is killer. Ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Yes, here it comes. The chemicals are beginning to act. The writing is beginning to show up. Good. The name is... Nick, look out! Oh, you got it, boy! Get out of here! And I got these two thugs, Nick. Knocked them out cold. So I had to plug in the shoulder coals, but I had to put you out of action. Now, Riley, there's your murderer. Uh, so it was Coles who did it. You're right, Carter. I killed him. Uh, the powers be praised, Nick. I thought Tom Marks was the killer. Coles had me fooled too, Riley. Until this afternoon when he came running down from the house. And then I noticed his feet were wet. As if he'd been in waiting. Then he was one of the men on the yacht. One of the fishermen Riley saw. Right, Patsy. And another thing. The man who strangled me in the boathouse claimed to be Tom Marks. But Tom Marks is left-handed. The man who tried to strangle me used his right hand. And you knew Phillips was murdered by a left-handed man. That's right. I knew I was after a left-handed murderer. O'Reilly, did you notice that when Coles lighted your cigarette for you this afternoon in Rosa's room, he used his left hand? See, by golly, he did. Then then, then he's left-handed, too. Right. When I saw him do that, I knew he was the killer. But I had to make him prove it. Oh, you did that all right. That business about making the writing stand out on a piece of paper after it's burned is a new one to me, Nick. Nick, can you actually do that? Well, it can be done under ideal conditions, but this time I was just putting on an act for Mr. Coles' benefit. You mean you didn't actually make any writing appear on the burned paper? Not a word, Mr. Coles. And I fell for it like a sap. Nick. Hmm? What's that? Well, I'm not sure, Patsy, but I have a hunch. It's locked, Nick. Oh, Patsy, since when did a locked door ever stop Nick Carter? Quite right, Riley. When did it? This is no time for it to start. So, this one ought to do the trick. There we are. Nick Carter. Oh, thank heaven, Rose. This man with you is Tom Marks, Miss Phillips? Yes, I am. They were going to kill us, Mr. Carter. They tied us up and threw us in here. We heard them planning to throw us overboard. Have you been imprisoned in here all this time, Mr. Marks? Uh, no, not quite. I got a telephone call last night summoning me into the city to pick up some chemicals Dr. Phillips and I needed in an experiment. I was slugged as I stepped out of the car. And when I came too late this afternoon, I, I was in here. And so was Rose. Uh, that cause was a smart one. Throwing suspicion on you and then trying to get rid of you in order to make it look as if you'd run away. Smart, but not smart enough for Nick. Well, Riley, you've got your murderer. I have that. And Rose, you and Tom are safe. Yes, thanks to you. And I guess that's that. Oh, no, Nick. You still have to solve my case. Oh, what's that, Patsy? That luncheon date you promised me. Oh. Where are you and I going to have lunch at this hour? Why, uh... Well, say, that's easy, Patsy. I know a swell place in town. Right across from the morgue. Come on. This was another strange experience of Nick Carter, master detective, called the Drug Ring Murder, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Left-Handed Killer. Another of the curious adventures of Nick Carter, which are brought to you regularly at the same time by WOR Mutual. And now, Nick, what can you tell us about next week's story? When a young man who was a very good friend of mine arrived in town to claim his bride, he suddenly became aware that she was not the girl to whom he'd become engaged. You mean she wasn't his fiancée? That was the question that started off the whole case. Yes, indeed. Because we couldn't be sure whether the girl he loved was really the girl he loved, we prevented two murders and saved a gigantic fortune from disappearing. But you didn't save me from disappearing, Nick. Oh, quite true, Patsy. But after all, you weren't gone very long before we found you. But I'm sure glad you found me when you did, or I might not be here now. So long, folks. Get the rest of the story next week. Right. So long. And so long to you, Nick and Patsy. In the strange adventure you have just heard, Nick Carter was impersonated by Lon Clark, Patsy by Helen Choate. The story was written for Nick Carter by Barth Connery. Original music was played by Lou White. The entire production was under the direction of Jock McGregor.
Next week at the same time, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter entitled... The Substitute Bride. Or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Night Ferry. This story is a copyrighted feature of Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. The return of Nick Carter is produced in the studios of WOR and is broadcast over most of these stations every Wednesday evening at 8.30 Eastern War Time. This is Mutual. another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Tonight's curious adventure... The Substitute Bride, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Night Ferry. Here, here, take your hands off me. Now, what are you doing? Now, let me go. Now, put me down. No, no, stop it. Ah! Nick, there's a young man here to see you. Says he's no friend of yours. Well, hello, Nick. Alan Marvin. Well, Helen, it's good to see you again. And what brings you to this part of the country? I came east to get married, Nick. Well, congratulations. Oh, wait a minute. I'm afraid your congratulations are a little premature. What's the matter? I don't know. I can't find her. Can't find her? Well, what on earth do you mean by that? Well, look, it's like this, Nick. Alice Evans and I have been engaged for about four years. But for the past three years, she's been living in South America with friends of her family. She was due back in this country yesterday on the Gallia, so I came on from Chicago to meet her. Her boat got in ahead of schedule, and my train was late, so we missed connections. I'd already told her I was coming, but in spite of that, she was gone by the time I got to the dock last night. Didn't she leave any message for you? No, not a word. That's odd. And she has no friends in this part of the country that she could stay with. Well, didn't anyone at the boat know where she went? Well, apparently not, Nick. The stewardess says a boy brought her a note, and as soon as she read it, she got dressed and went ashore. There was a taxi waiting for her, and she went off in it. An hour later, an expressman called for her trunks. Perhaps she went to a hotel. Hotel? But, oh, why should she do that when I told her that I'd meet her at the boat? No, Nick. Something has happened to her, I'm sure of it. Nick, the hmm? morning paper says that there's a Miss Alice Evans registered at the Hamilton Park Hotel. What's that? Would that be the same girl? Here, let me see that, will you? Quick. Hmm, right here. <laughs> well, then she did go to a hotel. Oh, gee, what a... Fool I was for worrying you, Nick. I think nothing of it, Alan. Glad you found her. Well, if you, uh, if you don't mind, Nick, I think I'll... Uh... Sure, go right ahead. I know how anxious you are to see her. Hey, look, Nick. Why don't you come with me? I'd like very much to have you meet her. Well, Alan, this seems hardly the time to... Oh, drink. come on. No, Nick, come on. I want you to meet her. You'll like her. Well, all right, if you insist. But I've heard it said that three is usually a crowd, especially after two of them have been separated for three years. <laughs> Taxi! Second and fifth rabbit. Well, Ellen, I gather that you feel that our visit to the young lady was not a complete success. Nick, something's wrong. I, I don't know what. So I noticed. That's why I stayed until you left. I tell you, she's changed. I can't put my finger on it, but she's different somehow. Well, three years is a long time, Ellen. Some change would be quite natural. Oh, but it isn't that kind of change, Nick. But doesn't she look the same? She does, and she doesn't. You mean you don't think she is, Alice Evans? She must be. Yet. Then you're not sure. Uh, I wish her father were here. He'd know immediately whether she's his daughter or not. Where is he? Chicago? I don't know. He told me he was meeting the boat, but as far as I know, he hasn't shown up. She said she hadn't seen him. Well, he probably was delayed in getting away. Look, you... You don't suppose anything could have happened to him, do you? You know, like so many rich men, he always carried several hundred dollars with him. Well, it's possible, of course, Ellen. Was there anything distinctive about his appearance? 
Well, he's a shortish man, stout, white hair. Oh, yeah, he wore old-fashioned side whiskers. Well, those should make him easy to identify. I'll have Lieutenant Riley get in touch with the Chicago police and see if they know anything about it. Oh, good. Then I'll have Patsy make the round of the hospitals here in town. I'll send Penny to the terminal and the ferries to see if he can pick up any information about him there. Mm-hmm. Well, we ought to find out something that way. And I think my next step will be to visit the Galliard or Dock. See what I can learn there. The main reason I'm taking you to see Miss Evans first is that I want you to tell me whether or not she's the girl who made the trip up in South America with you. I understand, sir. Now, you, the purser of the Gallia, probably had as good a chance to see her as anyone. Oh, why, yes, sir, but none of us saw her very much. Uh, she took ill right after we sailed and stayed in her room almost the entire trip. But you say you'd be able to identify her positively. Oh, yes, sir. I have an excellent memory for faces, and uh, she was a real looker. She was. Here's her hotel. Come on. Right, sir. Here, take this elevator. Three, please. This is her floor. Her room's right across the corridor here. Oh, oh, come in, Mr. Carter. Thank you, Miss Evans. You, of course, know this gentleman, Miss Evans? Why, I... I... Well, let me see. Oh, well, it, it's hardly fair to expect her to remember me, Mr. Carter. She was so ill every time I saw her that I doubt if she'd ever really got a good look at me the old voyage. Oh, why, of course. Now I know who you are. You're one of the officers off the Gallia. We came up from South America together. That's right, Mum. See, sir, she knows me right enough. Oh, I knew I'd seen you somewhere. If, if I hadn't been so sick, I'd have remembered you at once. I see. Well, Miss Evans, our call is really in the nature of business. The first I found a valuable lot of jewelry left behind in the ship, and I was called in to help find the owner. As it was near your cabin, we'd come to you first. I haven't missed any of my jewels, but I'll let you know if I do. Thank you. Have you had any word from your father yet? No, not a word. Do you suppose anything's happened to him? What did he look like, Miss Evans? Why, he was... Here. I'll show you his picture. You can tell better by that. Here you are, Mr. Carter. That's my father. Are you a detective? Yes, Miss Evans. I am. Then you must find him for me. I don't care what it costs. Very well. I'll see what I can do. Shall we go, Purser? Oh, yes, sir. Good day, miss, and good luck to you. Goodbye, and thank you. I'll let you know as soon as I learn anything, Miss Evans. Good day. Well, Purser, was that the Miss Evans who made the trip with you in the Gallia? Oh, positively, sir. I know her anywhere. You're sure? Ah, there's no question whatever, sir. I'd swear to it on a stack of Bibles afoot, I would. <laughs> Find a thing, Nick. There's nobody in the hospital who answers to the description of Mr. Evans. Oh, I hardly expected you to find anything, Patsy. But we had to be sure. Well, did the Chicago police know anything about him? Riley said they had no report of anything having happened to him there. Mm-hmm. What did Penny find? Well, Penny hasn't come in yet. Oh, hey, he... Nick. I couldn't find any traces of the old boy at the tunnel, but I did find something at the ferry. What'd but you I... find? Oh, uh, that'll keep, Nick. Right now, I got a taxi waiting outside, and the driver of the taxi is the fellow who took Alex Evans from the boat to the hotel last night. And he knows something. How'd you find him? Oh, the stewardess on the galley pointed him out to me. I'm afraid if I try to bring him in here, I'll scare him. I already asked him a lot of questions. I'll go outside and talk to him myself. Oh, driver, I'm Nick Carter. So what? I ain't interested. But I am. I'm interested in what you can tell me about a young lady you picked up at the galley last night. You took her to the Hamilton Park Hotel, didn't you? All right, so what if I did? Look, you'll save yourself time and trouble if you'll answer my questions. You picked her up about 8 o'clock, didn't you? Yeah, about that. How long a drive is it to the hotel? Yeah, about a half hour. Maybe if the lights was against you, 45 minutes. And how does it happen that you didn't register in at the hotel until nearly 10 o'clock? Well, I did. 
Where'd you go between the time you left the galley and the time you reached the hotel? I stopped off at a house on 22nd Street for a while. Did Miss Evans leave the cab? Yeah. She said she wanted to see Winslow's daughter. Said they went to school together. You mean it was David Winslow's house you stopped at? Yeah, I said so, didn't I? Yes, you did. Thanks. Here. This will pay you for what's on the meter and for the information. Okay. So long. Find out anything, Nick? That depends, Patsy. Now, Penny, what was the dope you got at the ferry? Well, it's like this, Nick. I found one of the ferry guards who remembered seeing an old guy with big white side whiskers get on the ferry about the time Evans' train must have got in from Chicago, see? Well, this guard got such a kick out of the whiskers that he watched for the old guy to get off the boat at the other side so he could get another gander at him. And did he? Nah, the old guy didn't get off. What? What? Was you sure? Sure. And the old guy wasn't on the boat anywhere. Well, that would sound as if something might have happened to him during that very night. Nick. Oh, Alan. Nick, I've got some news. Mr. Evans was alive this morning. Is that so? How do you know? I'll tell you. I went to see Mr. Evans' banker this afternoon to see if he had any word from him. He showed me a check that Mr. Evans had made out this morning. A check for $50,000. Dated this morning? Mm -hmm. Yes. It was made out to John Smith and endorsed by David Winslow. David Winslow? You're sure of that, Ellen? Yes, I'm sure. Why, Nick? Here's why. Last night, a girl who claims to be Alice Evans, but apparently isn't, stops off at Winslow's house on the way to the hotel. Yeah. Mr. Evans disappears last night. And yet a check made out by him this morning turns up endorsed by Winslow himself. Hey, wait a minute. That does look suspicious. Certainly does. That's it. Tomorrow morning, you and I are going to call on Mr. Winslow. Very good of you to see me, Mr. Winslow. I'm Nick Carter, the detective. Yes, I've heard of you, Mr. Carter. Miss Bowen, my assistant. How do you do, Mr. Good Ms. morning, Mr. Winslow. What can I do for you, Miss Carter? Mr. Winslow, do you know James Evans? Only very slightly. Are you acquainted with his daughter, Alice? No, Miss Carter, I'm not. I see. Did a check of Mr. Evans recently pass through your hands? Why, yes, it did. I cashed one of his checks yesterday. Did you know that Mr. Evans disappeared the day before the date well, on that no, check? Well, he did. You don't say. Would you be in a position to know if the signature on the check were a forgery? Well, the signature was genuine, all right. When Mr. Smith presented for payment a check in the amount of $50,000, I naturally sent the check to Mr. Evans' bank for verification. They said it was good, so I paid Smith the money. I see. You said a few moments ago that you didn't know Alice Evans. Yes, I did. But didn't she call here night before last? Why? Oh, yes, she did. She called to see my daughter. They were classmates at school. My daughter was not at home, so she talked to my wife for a while and left. I thank you for your trouble, Mr. Winslow. Not at all. Come on, Patsy. Time for running along. Okay, Nick. Good morning, Mr. Winslow. Good morning. Good day, Mr. Winslow. Good day to you, sir. Patsy, I'd be tempted to believe what he said, even if I didn't know that he has an excellent reputation in banking circles here in town. Well, what he told us certainly sounded straightforward enough to allow him. Patsy. See that man going in the house next door? Oh, yes. What about it, Nick? I saw that man in court a few weeks ago, charged with murderous assault. What? And now we found him going into the house next door to Winslow's. Patsy, mm -hmm. I want you to get back to the office immediately. Tell Penny to see what he can find out about that house. The address is 832 West 22nd Street. Yes, Nick. I want to know more about that place. <laughs> Eight thirty-two West Twenty-second Street, Riley. Well, no, Nick, that's a curious thing. Hmm? One of the boys picked up a bum this morning, and when we searched him, we found a slip of paper in his pocket with that same address on it. Swell, Riley. Hold him. I'll be right down. I don't know. I tell you. How many times I got to keep on saying that? You don't know who pushed the man off the ferry, who kidnapped his daughter, where she is now, or anything about it? No, I tell you, no. Who's the girl who's staying at the Hamilton Park Hotel under the name of Evans? Where's the Hamilton Park Hotel? All right, Baker, all right. Guess I must have you all wrong. I'll say you have. 
You live at 832 West 22nd Street? Well, I don't exactly... No. Who does live there? Oh, how should I know? Where does David Winslow live? Ah, uh, right next... Who's David Winslow? All right. Yeah, Nick? I'm through with Baker. Not the fellow I thought he was. All right, Baker. The guard's waiting for you just outside the door. You'll take you back to your cell. Okay. I hope you're getting what you're looking for, Carter. Well, Nick, what did you find? Riley. Baker thought he told me nothing. But his answers weren't as clever as he thought they were. Yeah. Actually, he told me that Evans was thrown off the ferry into the river and that he was picked up in a rowboat that was waiting for him. Well... And I also discovered that he knows David Winslow and that he knows what goes on at 832 West 22nd Street. Gee. All of which, while not conclusive evidence, tells me I'm on the right track. Nice going, Nick. Well, what's next? Riley, I want you to release this man, Baker, at once. What? Well, release him, Nick. But, but why? I want to be sure the rest of the gang knows I'm on their trail. The first thing Baker will do when he gets out of here will be to tell him. They'll undoubtedly make some move to try and stop me. And that may bring him out in the open. Benny, what'd you find out? Well, I'll tell you, Nick. Whoever's running that gang's keeping it pretty secret. None of my old pals know anything about it. All I could find out is that the address is the hideout of what they call the Secret Six. Yeah. A ex-convict, the call they call the butler, takes care of the place during the day and keeps it cleaned up. That would be the man Patsy and I saw. Well, what about David Winslow? Ah, nobody connects his name with it nowhere. Hmm. He must be extremely clever. Or I'm extremely much of a dope. Ah, you're no dope, Nick. I dope. Hey, where's Patsy? She asked me to bring her back some peanuts. Oh, she wants to see that girl who's posing as Alice Evans at her hotel. Hey, wait. I didn't realize it was so late. She should have been back by now. Found this note at her desk when I came in about lunchtime. Yeah. yeah. Again, Nick. Girl who calls herself Alice Evans just called to say she had information on her father's disappearance. When I told her you weren't here, she asked me to go over and she'd give it to me and I could get it to you. We'll take a run over to the hotel and see what she wants. See you at the office when I get back, Patsy. And that was almost five hours ago. Say, look. Should we go over there and have a look, see? Well, first I'll phone Miss Evans. Hamilton Park Hotel. That's, um, Sherma 324 Gee, if that bunch of crooks has tried anything on Patsy... Hamilton what? Park Hotel. Good afternoon. Miss Alice Evans, please. Miss Evans, I'll connect you. Thank you. You know, I ain't known Patsy long, but she's a pretty swell kind of dame for... I'm sorry, Miss Evans doesn't answer. Thanks. Nobody home? No, Penny. And I don't like it. I think I better get going and... Wait a minute. Nicholas Carter's office. Nick Carter? Yeah? Who's this? If you want to see your girlfriend Patsy again, Carter, keep out of the Evans case. What do you mean? If you make another move to try and find out what happened to old man Evans or his daughter, you can kiss your girlfriend goodbye. It'll be curtains for her. <laughs> Because the Secret Six meets here doesn't mean that they'll be keeping Patsy a prisoner here. I know that, Benny. But we saw a couple of members of the gang go in here a few minutes ago, didn't we? Yeah, sure we did. Well, if I can't make them tell me what they've done with Patsy, my name isn't Nick Carter. Oh, whatever you say, Nick. They say that man they call the butler is upstairs in the first floor now? Yeah, he's writing in the back parlor. And let's get to the basement. Quick. Oh, but the door's locked, Nick. It's got a special Townsend lock on it. Well, that won't be the first door with a Townsend lock on it. But my little pick lock is open. There. Quiet now. Wonder where this door goes. Oh, that leads into the basement of the house next door, Nick. Then I'm right. That's the basement of the house where that banker Winslow lives. He is in on this. Hey, Nick. Sounds like somebody's coming down here. You're right, Penny. Here, quick. There's a storage closet. Get in here. I'll leave the door open a crack so we can watch him. It's that butler, Penny. You're not going to gag me again, are you? That must be old man Evans. Uh, what's that stuff you have there? Oh, if you call that food, you can take it away. Penny, Penny, if 
one of us stands on each side of that door. We can grab the bucket when he comes out. But don't let him call out. Those other guys might hear him. Well, whatever you say, Nick. Like this? Go on. Yeah, that's get out of here. Go on. Get out. Here he comes. Now. Hey. Good. All right. Drag him into Evan's room. Here. Wait. Now. Shut the door. Okay. What's this? What are you doing? You're Mr. Evans, aren't you? Oh, yes, yes, well, I I'm am. the detective, Nick Carter. Well... Oh, thank heavens. You know where the other two men are that we saw come in here a little while ago? They're probably in the room where the gang meets at the end of this hallway, Butler, sir. Butler! That's Winslow. With Mr. Evans. Yes? What does this butler's voice sound like? Well, very much like yours, except that he had a kind of dialect. No particular country, just foreign. Butler! I'm, I'm How does the butler address Winslow? Uh, just Senor Winslow, I, I think, see. sir. Yes, Senor Winslow. You call me? I've called you several times. Where have you been? I've been trying to find something in the back of the storage closet. You wish something, Senor? Yes. When the boys come in for the meeting tonight, tell them not to leave until I get here, no matter what time it is. You understand? But of course, they must not leave until you come. I will tell them. All right, and don't forget. Oh, that was amazing, Mr. Carter. It was almost a perfect imitation. All right, Penny. You better get this butler chap tied up and gagged before he comes to. Well, whatever you say, Nick. Mr. Evans. Yes? You know why you were kidnapped and brought here? Why, yes, Mr. Carter. They want my fortune. I know they've kidnapped my daughter and substituted in her place a girl who looks enough like her to be her double. They plan to have her get possession of everything she can, sir. Then they forced you to write that check for $50,000, didn't they? Yes. But, Mr. Carter, do you know where my daughter is? I'm sorry, Mr. Evans, I don't. But I expect to know very soon. Oh. Come on, Penny. Let's get down the hall and let those thugs tell us where Patsy is. Whatever you say, Nick. What do I do then, yeah, all right. Hold it, Benny. I'll turn the knob on the door very gently. Then when I give the okay, word, you'll rush him, just in case there may be more than two in there. Whatever you say, Nick. Easy now. Yeah, all right. right. Get your hands up, all of you. Oh, oh. Nice shooting, Nick. Oh. He should have known better than to pull a gun on you. Oh. All right, you get up. Oh. It's only your wrist that's hurt. <laughs> Come on, get up. Now drop your guns on the floor. Uh. Come on, let's have them. Now then, what have you crooks done with my assistant, Patsy? You heard what I said? What have you done with her? We don't know nothing about her. No? Well, maybe you don't know it, mister, but when I get mad, I can be dirty and mean, and somebody gets hurt. Now, where is she? I tell you, we don't know anything. Butler! It's Winslow again. Penny, keep a gun on these two. They open their mouths, let them have it, and shoot to kill. Butler, why don't you answer me? Pardon, senor. We are having a conference. We did not expect you until later. You are coming in here... I just wanted to tell you that I don't expect to be... Put him up, Mr. Winslow. I'll do the telling from now on. Why, what's the meaning of this, Mr. Carter? You can't... Shut up. Where's Patsy? Where's who? You heard me. What have you done with my assistant, Patsy Bone? I don't know anything about... Where is she? No, don't. Where is she? Don't. You'll break my arm. Stop. For the last time, where is she? Oh, stop it. Stop it. I'll tell you. Oh, my arm. Well... She's upstairs. Second floor back bedroom. Door locked, I suppose. Oh, I'll get it, Nick. I took the butler's keys away from him. Good work, Penny. Make it snappy. I'll watch these two for a nickel thugs. Yeah, whatever you say, Nick. All right, Winslow. Get over against the wall with the rest of your cheap bums. And if you've hurt one single hair on Patsy's head, you'll be lucky if you live long enough for me to turn you over to the police. She's all right. We did nothing to her at all. Lucky for you. Tell me, Winslow. Why'd you throw Evans off the ferry boat? Wouldn't it have been easier to have kidnapped him someplace else? I had the ferries watched for several days. And found at the time of night, in the bitter cold weather we've been having, the rear deck of the ferries almost always deserted. So we planned it that way. We had other plans ready in case that didn't work out. Oh, Nick, am I glad to see you. Oh, Patsy, are you all right? Uh, Anybody hurt you? No, Nick. They're a little rough, but they got as good as they gave me. Look at that black eye on the guy on the left. Good for you, Patsy. Ah, uh, hey, Nick. After I got Patsy loose, I looked in some of the other rooms, and I found this dame in the front room up there. Say she's Marion Blake. My name is Marion Blake. You're not Marion Blake. You're Alice Evans. No. No, I'm not Alice Evans. I'm Marion Blake. Aren't you saying that you're Marion Blake because you're afraid the gang will hurt your father if you admit you are really Alice Evans? What? Well, you're quite safe now, Miss Evans. Oh, Mr. Evans. Yes? Will you come in here, please? Uh, yes, Mr. Carter. My father here? And free? Yes, Miss Evans. 
Here he is. Oh, 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 I... Oh, Benny, you. you better go get Riley. You'll find him waiting just around the corner. He can take over now. Tell me where you were. Uh, Mr. Carter, I can never thank you enough for what you've done. We owe you our lives, Ellis and I. You don't owe me anything, Mr. Evans. Getting rats like these out of circulation gives me more satisfaction than anything else ever could. This is your room. You two wait here till I call you. Come in. Good morning, Miss Evans. Oh, good morning, Mr. Carter. Have you discovered anything about my father? I was about to ask you the same question. Have you heard from him? No, Mr. Carter. Nothing. Well, let me be the first to bring you the good news. Good news? Yes. Your father has been found. He... He's been found? Yes. He was kidnapped and imprisoned by some crooks who were trying to steal his fortune. Oh, my poor father. Where was he found? In a basement room where the gang was keeping him prisoner. Has he... Has he told you what happened to him? Oh, yes. He told us everything. Everything? Oh, by the way, Miss Evans, I brought a friend with me this morning. I thought you might like to meet her. May I ask her in? Yes. Yes, of course. Alan. Will you bring the young lady in? Okay, Nick. <gasps> Do you recognize this young lady, Miss Evans? All right, Mr. Carter. Can drop that Miss Evans stuff now. I see you know the whole story. Practically the whole story, yes. Oh, Alice, have you met the real Marion Blake? No, I haven't. My goodness, she does look like me, doesn't she? Yes, but she didn't fool me, dear. No, I suppose I was crazy to believe that I could fool a man who was as much in love with you as he is, Miss Evans. Resemblance is certainly close enough to fool almost anyone else, though. Why, she even sounds like me. Miss Blake, whose idea was it to substitute you for Alice Evans? My husband. He was the head of a Chicago gang. Saw a picture in the paper and the idea came to him. Her coming back from South America seemed to be the ideal setup for carrying out the scheme, so we came east to do it. We knew Winslow from a couple of jobs we did from Chicago. Didn't it occur to your husband that when you threw my father off the ferry... He might get pneumonia in the icy water and die. We didn't worry about that. We knew he'd live long enough for what we wanted. Why, you cold... Alice, 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 take it easy. But did you hear what you... That's all over with, dear. The police will take care of her now. I'm not usually bloodthirsty. But I hope she gets the electric chair. Well, the chair is hardly the sentence for attempted extortion, Alice. But by the time she gets out of jail, she'll no longer be young and pretty. And with the marks that prison will leave on her, she'll never again be able to double for you. This was another strange experience of Nick Carter, Master Detective, called The Substitute Bride or Nick Carter in the Mystery of the Night Ferry. Another of the curious adventures of Nick Carter, which are brought to you regularly at this time by WOR Mutual. And now, Nick. What strange adventure are you and Patsy going to tell us about next week? Next week, I want to tell you about a case that never seemed to be twice the same. What do you mean by that, Nick? Well, what Nick means is this. The case started out as a suicide, turned into a murder, and then disappeared entirely. And I disappeared with it. Well, all this sounds very screwy to me. Are you sure you're talking about next week's story? Nothing else but. But I'm afraid that if you want any more details, You'll have to listen to the story itself. And if you're wise, you won't miss it. It's one of our best. That it is. But for now, so long, folks. So long. And so long to you both until next week. In the strange adventure you have just heard, Nick Carter was impersonated by Lon Clark, Patsy by Helen Choate. Original music was played by Lou White. The entire production was written and directed by Jock McGregor. <laughs> Next week, at the same time, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter entitled... The Disappearing Corpse. Or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Apartment House Murder. (laughs) 
This story is a copyrighted feature of Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. The Return of Nick Carter is produced in the studios of WOR and is broadcast over most of these stations every Wednesday evening at 8.30 Eastern War Time. This is Mutual. It's another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Tonight's curious adventure, a special Christmas story. Nick Carter's Christmas Adventure. Or the mystery of the reluctant contributor. <laughs> We've been pretty lucky so far, haven't we? Yes, Guppy, we have. Which is another way of saying that folks are usually willing to contribute to your settlement house Christmas party every year, Nick. You know, Scubby, I was just thinking about this last name on our list. Yeah? Rasper. I don't know him personally. You? No, I don't, but somebody must have thought he was rich enough or interested enough in the work to make a substantial contribution. Oh, here's the... Hey, is this... Hey, Nick, what's that address again? 576 Milton Avenue. Yeah. Yes, that's right. And there's his name on the door plate. Well, let's take a look, Scubby. Well, gosh, this doesn't make sense, Nick. A guy with dough doesn't hide away in a place like this. Well, knock on the door anyhow. Doesn't seem to be anybody here, Nick. No, hold it, Scubby. I hear someone coming. Who is it? I'm Nicholas Carter. May I speak to Mr. Rasper, please? Nick Carter, eh? Yes, yes. And this is my assistant, Scubby Wilson. How do you do? Uh, You, Mr. Rasper? Yes. Well, come in, come in. It's cold out there. You're letting all the heat out. Oh, beg your pardon. Come on, Scubby. Yeah. I'm in, Nick. I'm in. Well, what was it you wanted? Well, Mr. Rasper, I've come to see if you would care to make a contribution to my Christmas party fund. I never make contributions. Oh, but you didn't let Nick finish, sir. The fund provides food and extra clothing for the needy and deserving the children. The charity for... department's still working, isn't it? Well, of course, Mr. Rasper, but my object is to provide an inspiration for the young people who are underprivileged. People who haven't got any money are always trying to get it from those who have. Then you aren't interested in seeing that the children of the Lincoln Hall District are helped to a little happiness on Christmas Day? No, I'm not. Christmas is old-fashioned. I don't believe in it. It's a waste of money and time. Good day. Oh, well, Mr. Rasper, it's always been a lot of fun for me personally. And I must say that I've always felt better for celebrating it. And I'm inclined to agree with Scotty, Mr. Rasper. Christmas has always been a bright spot in my life. And I feel sure that if you knew the good it has done throughout the world, it'd make you change your mind. Rubbish. Well... In any case, a Merry Christmas to you. Good day to you. Merry Christmas indeed. A lot of nonsense. Come on, Nick. Let's get back to civilization. You know, Scubby, that man's wealthy. No doubt about that. And yet he's soured on Christmas. And everything it stands for. <laughs> you said a mouthful, Dick. You know, Scubby, there must be reason why he thinks that way. And I'd like to find out what it is. Yeah, but you haven't anything to work on, Nick. Oh, no, Scubby, I haven't. Not yet. But look here. I can finish up whatever has to be done this afternoon. Suppose you hop down to the newspaper office and go yeah. through the files there. There might just be something we could learn about Rasper that way. Okay, Nick, I'll be glad to. Then I'll have Riley check through the files at headquarters. It's a long shot, but something might turn up. Sure, and maybe Patsy has run into something while she's been working down at the settlement house. She might know somebody who knows something about Rasper. Yeah, she might have that. I'll ask her about it. Okay. And maybe with all of us working together on it, we may learn why Rasper's so dead set against Christmas. I'd certainly like to find out. Hello, is is that you, Nick? Uh, Riley talking. I've been through my files here, and I I can't find anything charged against a man named Ben Rasper. He he was licensed to do business with a man named Howard Lowe, but Lowe died some years ago. Otherwise, Rasper is just a successful businessman. Uh, That's right. Uh, I'll tell you what, though, Nick. There's an old fellow named Fred Anderson who used to be on the force who knows Rasper. Uh, Sure, Uh, you can find him at uh, Lincoln Hall where you're given the party. Uh, He's the watchman there now. Okay, Nick, that's all right. Uh, See you tomorrow. Uh, Hello, hello. Oh, yes, Scubby? Oh, you did, huh? Sports promoter, huh? Well, well. 
What was that name again? Chris Baum. Why, yes, yes, I recall. Oh, no, I'll be there in about an hour, sir. I want to call Patsy first. Right. And thanks, Gubby. Bye. Ah, jingle bell, jingle bell, jingle all the way. Oh, my son, it is to ride in a horse with me, say. Jingle bell, jingle bell, jingle all the way. Oh, what? Hi, Patsy. How's everything, huh? Oh, fine. I'm coming down to the hall. Is there anything you want me to bring along? Uh-huh. Why, sure, I can do that. But will that be enough, though? Okay. Yeah, yeah, Scubby just called. Oh, he found out something about Rasper. What? You did, too. How old is he? Named Jimmy, huh? And he's coming to our party? Oh, fine, fine, Patsy. Okay, I'll see you in a little while. Bye. Oh, that's fine. We've collected enough to do this year's party upright. Now let's get organized. Riley, yeah? your job will be to get the kids and the needy persons rounded up. Oh, sure, Nick. I'll take care of it. I got your lists and the list from the social worker and from the church down there. And there are plenty of others who'll need a lift this year, believe me. I know it, Riley, and I'll depend on you. Scubby, it's your job to see that the tree and decorations and gifts are taken care of. Don't worry, Nick. Decorating is my middle name. I'll make Lincoln Hall look like a million dollars in cash. <laughs> good boy, good boy. And Patsy, hmm? you'll see to it that there's plenty to eat and drink for the party, so I won't have to worry about that. I'll take care of the bills, and you have the letters of credit the stores gave us. You know how to do that. Sure thing, Nick. I've Good. been through it with you often enough before. I ought to know what you want by this time. Uh, well, what are you going to be doing, Nick? Me? Well, Riley, I'm going to do a little detecting. I'm going to look into those tips you, Patsy, and Scubby gave me about those people who know Ben Rasper. And by the time I'm through, I hope to find out why it is that he hates Christmas the way he does. And then, well, then, maybe I'll be able to do something about it. This is Rasper talking. Yes? I sent you the bell, didn't I? Well, what if it is due on the 27th? No, just because it's a holiday, no tell reason for a bill to be unpaid. Ah, goodbye. Oh, darn fool nonsense, that's what it is. There's a lot of foolish... Still talking big, ain't you, Rasper? Well, who's there? What do you want? Don't you remember me, Rasper? No, I don't remember you. Who are you? They used to call me the kid. Chris the Kid. Chris, sometimes known as the human flesh. Chris, you. Oh. Well, it's been a long time, Rasper, hasn't it? Uh, how'd you find me? Who sent you here? A fellow named Nick Carter told me I'd find you here in your office, even if it is Christmas Eve. Nick Carter? Oh, yes. Wanted me to give him some money for some fool party. Oh, for the party at Lincoln Hall, I guess. Ace never asked me for anything. Just gave me what I needed. When I needed it. Yeah. So he hired you to come here and take up my no, time to no, get... No, he didn't send me here. This said I'd find you here, that's all. I came here on my own accord. To... Just to wish you a Merry Christmas. Ha. Thought you'd say that. Well, I don't mind. Because it's on account of Nick Carter that I can stand on my own feet again. Not on account of you. What's that? You mind if I uh, sit down? It was on Christmas Eve that we won our first fight, wasn't it? Fight? Oh, yeah, a long time ago. Yeah, it was a long time ago. I can remember the noise of the crowd, the glare of the lights and the smoke curling around and the brightness over the ring, and you leaning over me with that wet towel. You got him going, Chris. Another one like that last round and you'll have him in the ropes for the count. How do you feel now, kid? I'm okay, Rasper. Just let me out of it. I don't have to wait anymore. It's my meat right now. now. You take your orders from me, kid. I'm the brains here. When you get the signal from me, you'll give it to him. Okay, Rasper. You're the boss. Go ahead, kid. That's up. Keep your shoulder high. Keep it up. That's right, kid. That's the ticket. Now you can take him. That's it. Take him, Chris. Now. There are a lot of those little affairs after that, Rasper. And I always did what I was told, huh? Yes. You're a good fighter, Chris. Good fighter. I made a lot of money for us in those fights, Vasper. Well, a lot of in money. the old days, Chris. Lots of water's gone under lots of bridges since then. I know. And the percentage you paid me didn't last long either. It went just like that water. 
But I didn't care much about things like that. Till the day a friend of mine came and gave me a warning tip. That started me thinking. Oh, Kent, how do you feel? Oh, hello, Rasper. Where you been? I wanted to talk to you. Oh, I've been around. What's up? I got a tip today. That you're signing up Timmy O'Day. You're going to manage him. Oh, don't do that. Never mind. Is it true? That depends. Depends on what? Look, kid, you're getting slow. O'Day's fresh. He'll be the next champ. If he wins this fight with you tonight, I'm taking him over. And if I win tonight? I'm taking O'Day over anyhow. We've been together a long time, kid, and it don't pay to get in too much of a rut. So that's all it means to you, is it? Money. The payoff, huh? What about all the years we've known each other? What about the things we've been through? Why, you... No, know... don't get yourself all in a sweat, kid. It isn't good for you. You'll get your cut anyway. Don't worry. You'll get your cut. I'll see you later. Rasp, what do I do? Tell me what to do. I can't see him. My eyes are puffed up. He's cut me to ribbons. Tell me what to do, Rasp. <laughs> Don't bother me, kid. Use your own judgment. You're on your own, as of now. But Rasp, you always... You're on your own, kid. I can still see it sitting there in the ring corner, laughing at me. But that was the last thing I saw for a long time. Old day saw to that. You must have coached him pretty thorough about my style. And then you really cashed in. Well, I haven't got much myself, but I'm still able to wish you a Merry Christmas, Rasper. Although I don't think you'll ever have one. Chris, I... Well, I've got some things to do, Rasper. Carter asked me to pick up some things for the party at Lincoln Hall tomorrow. We always have a swell time at Carter's Christmas parties. Too bad you can't enjoy anything like that anymore. Well, as I said before, Rasper, Merry Christmas. Uh, how can a man work with his mind whirling like a merry-go-round Christmas Eve? God, it's a fine excuse for people to go around yelling at each other in the streets. Disturbing a man when he wants to get some work done. Oh, I might as well close the office and get some rest. Would have been home by now if the kid, if Chris, hadn't taken up so much time. What Chris does for a living now? Wonder if... Ah, it's none of my concern. Get home and get some sleep. That's what I need. Uh, who's that? I'm closing up. Come back tomorrow morning. Oh, I'm glad I got here before you left, Ben. Uh, who is it? It's Nina, Ben. Oh, Nina. I only stopped by to speak to you for a moment. It's getting quite late and uh, I... Uh... Well, sit down for a moment, Nina. Oh, thank here, you. Let me get your chair. I, uh, I suppose it's rather bold of me to come after all this time, but I... Why, no, Nina, no. I, I'm glad you did. Is there something you want? Oh, no. No, there's nothing you can do for me, Ben. Jimmy and I are doing very nicely. I just wanted to wish you a Merry Christmas. I was in the neighborhood doing some shopping for the party that Mr. Carter's giving at Lincoln Hall tomorrow, and How is I... he, Nina? Uh, Jimmy, I mean. Oh, he's fine, Ben. He's full of life and interested in everything. He has a good head on his shoulders, and he's very handsome, too. Oh, that's fine. Just fine. Uh, you're looking a little tired, Ben. Are you feeling well? Oh, uh, yes, yes, of course. I'm, I've been working hard, that's all. I've... Uh... Don't spend much time at home. Uh, not much reason to. Hmm. That's the way you wanted it, Ben. Don't you remember? Nina! Nina, where are you? Oh, Jimmy, there's Daddy. And wait here for Mommy like a good boy, won't you? Um, I'm coming, Ben. I've been keeping your dinner warm for you. I, I hope you'll... What's the matter, Ben? You look as if... That's you... nothing, Nina, nothing. I'm in a hurry, that's all. You're always in a hurry, aren't you? Never have time for... Where's my dinner? Sit down, Ben. I'll... I'll have it for you right away. <sighs> this plate is hot now. Be careful that you don't burn your plate. I won't. Salt, please. Here you are, dear. Ben, when you've finished, won't you take time enough out of your business to help me get the tree decorated? I know Jimmy's too young to know much about it, but... I'd love to have his Christmas all ready for him in the morning. Look, I'll, I'll put him to sleep right away, and then we can start. See, I have some holly and mistletoe for the fireplace, and... and, and I won't have time for that, Nina. 
But Ben, it's Christmas Eve. Surely you have I have to get back to the office. I'm putting on a championship match for a day in January, and the things have gone haywire. Something that can't wait till tomorrow. Uh, Have to get it organized right away, that's all. Ben, this is Christmas Eve. Tomorrow will be Jimmy's first Christmas. Doesn't that mean anything to you? You and Jimmy celebrate Christmas any way you want to, Nina. I have something more important to do. Business is more important than sentiment. You certainly can see that. Yes, Ben. I can see that. I've been seeing it more and more during the last few years. I thought that when Jimmy came, maybe you were... No, I was wrong, wasn't I, Ben? You'd even let your love for business break up our home. Break up our... Oh, don't be melodramatic, Nina. I'm not being melodramatic, Ben. I'm, I'm trying to be very calm and quiet about it. I've had a lot of time to think when I've sat alone here night after night. And those days on end when you've been away, attending to your business. And what has come out of all this thinking you've done? Just this, Ben. I'm not going on any longer. Either you belong to your family, or your family will get along without you. I have to rush, Nina. Uh, Good night. God, good night, Ben. It's good... Goodbye. Jimmy and I are leaving tonight. Look, I haven't time to talk about it with you now, Lena. Uh, Oh, uh, by the way, this will probably take most of the night. Good night. Goodbye, Ben, and... Merry Christmas. I never had much of a chance to make it up to you, Nina. You've had all the chance you wanted, Ben. But Nina, I... I just dropped by to say hello and to give you a wish for happiness during the holidays. It's hard not to share with you the joy I have with Jimmy. I I wish you could see his eyes dance at Mr. Carter's Christmas parties. Unfortunately, on what little I make, we can't very well afford to have our Christmas at home, but somehow we don't miss it. Everybody has such a grand time at Mr. Carter's party, and Jimmy does enjoy every minute that he's there. Goodness, I'll have to be on my way. Jimmy's waiting for me, and I have to make one more stop for Mr. Carter. Good night, Ben, and Merry Christmas. Tara, this stuff doesn't taste like anything. Nothing at all. Can't understand what's got into me. It's good food, fixed the same as it always is. It just doesn't taste right, that's all. What's that? Someone at the door this time of the night? I'm coming, I'm coming. Hello, Ben. It's Fred Anderson. Uh, glad I found you at home. I'm always at home this time of night. Yes, yes, I suppose you are, Ben. Uh, can I come in? Of course. I uh, brought your package, Ben. Nick Carter sent me around with it. Said you'd probably be here alone tomorrow and he'd like you to have it. Carter? What's Carter sending me? <laughs> you might open it and see, Ben. I'm no mind reader. <laughs> That's any reason why Carter would want to... Hmm. What a port wine. Let me see the card. Merry Christmas from Nick Carter. What's the idea? You know anything about this, Fred? No, but uh, Nick Carter's a funny duck. There's lots of things people don't expect him to. Why, I don't even know the man. Only saw him once and then... Um, you want a glass of this wine, Fred? <laughs> don't mind if I do, Ben. Seems it's Christmas Eve. I don't mind at all. There's some glasses here somewhere. Say, how do you open this thing? Here, I'll do it for you, Ben. Yeah, that does it. Well, go ahead, you open it. Eh? Oh, yes, all right. Well, there, ain't you drinking with me, Ben? Huh? Oh. Yes, I will. That's a ticket. <laughs> well, here's Merry Christmas for you, Ben. Oh, yes, sir. Merry Christmas. Well, how have you been keeping yourself, Fred? Oh, I've been sort of working around Lincoln Hall since I was retired from the force. I see. You know, while I was coming here tonight, I was thinking about those old days when I walked a beat. Funny, most folks call them the good old days, but I don't. You did all right in those times, didn't you? Oh, sure, I got along. I was just thinking about the different attitudes folks have nowadays toward being given a hand. 
They appreciate it more, it seems to me. Charity's still charity, Fred. That hasn't changed. I uh, guess it's all in the point of view, Ben. I guess you haven't changed with the times. That night I met you near the bridge. I was sure you were going to see that you were headed in the wrong direction and wake up in time. Huh? Remember that night, Ben? It was Christmas Eve. You'd just come from the arena. They'd handed you your walking papers because you'd let them down cold. Well, Merry Christmas, officer. Well, Merry Christmas to you, sir. Well, uh, uh, what are you doing out on a night like this, Ben? I thought you'd be up at the arena getting the New Year's fights lined up. What? Oh, it's you, Anderson. No, I'm not at the arena anymore. That's so. What happened? Uh, they decided tonight they'd rather have Davis take over my job. Fine Christmas present, that is. Well, uh, that's tough news, Ben. What are you going to do now? I don't know. I can't seem to think straight. Oh, that's a crazy way for a man like you to talk. On a Christmas Eve, too? <laughs> Christmas Eve. That's never been anything but a jinx to me. First I get stuck with that no-good fighter all day. Then Nina leaves me and takes my son with her. And now Irina throws me out. Well, uh, maybe you better stop and find out what it is you're doing wrong, Ben. Maybe you're the one that's to blame, not Christmas Eve. Uh, they all take advantage of me. I made all the money I could for them, but I'm not going to do it anymore. Uh, take it easy, Ben. Take it easy. You better go home and think it over. I have thought it over, Fred. And I know what the answer is. I'm going to make money for myself and nobody else. I'll show these people. I'll make so much money they'll come crawling to me on their knees. I won't have to ask for anybody's sympathy. You don't pay to think like that, Ben. You'll regret it. Now, look. I know that Phil Boynton, who runs the shoe store down on Elm Street, is looking for a man to buy in with him. Why don't Me you... Me work in a shoe store? Not in your life, Fred. I'm going after the big money. Big money! That's the only thing people understand, and I'm going to get it. Now you got it, Ben. You're one of the richest men in town. And what's he got you? Why, I don't know. Ben, it's too bad you don't get around and see what nice people there are in the world. People like this Carter fellow, for instance. Uh, does a man good to know people like him? Makes you feel there really is a Santa Claus to see him bring the smiles to the kids' faces at those parties he gives down at Lincoln Hall. Oh, well... I'll be getting back there now, Ben. I've got a big day tomorrow. I'm not as young as I used to be. <laughs> well, Merry Christmas to you, Ben. I'll tell Nina I saw you. She'll be at the party tomorrow with young Jimmy. Good night, Ben. Fancy, how's it going? Oh, Nick, it's wonderful. They're <laughs> oh. having a grand time. Oh, that's fine, Fancy. Hey, Fancy, look. Hmm? Over there by the door. What do you see? Where, Nick? Uh, well, who's that? That, Fancy, is Ben Rasper. Oh, I hope he's come to join the party. For heaven's sake, so that's the man I've heard so much about. But you look scared to death, Nick. Look, Fancy. Will you go over and make him welcome? Oh, of course, Nick. Good. Hello there. Merry Christmas. I'm Patsy Bowen. Oh. Won't you join us? How do you do? I hope I'm not... Do you mind if I just watch? Well, of course not. Come right in. I wanted to thank Mr. Carter for the gift you sent, and I... Nick's right over there near the tree. Come along. Uh, children seem to be enjoying themselves, don't they? They certainly do. There's Lieutenant Riley handing out the gifts there. It's Scotty Wilson with him, standing next to this girl. Uh, yes, I met Mr. Wilson. <laughs> Little Lieutenant Riley, he's having as much fun as the children. <laughs> so I see. Oh, there's a nice-looking boy there, Miss... Uh, who... I mean, what's his name? Where? Oh, that one over there. Oh, that's Jimmy. He's a nice boy. His mother was a big help to him in getting the refreshments ready. There she is over there on the far side of the hall at the table, see? Oh, yes. Her son. Yes. Yes, yes. I see. Uh, Nick, we have a new guest. Oh, hello there, Mr. Rasper. Merry Christmas. I'm glad you could join us. Uh, thank you, Mr. Carter. I 
I came to express my appreciation for the gift you sent me. Uh, I hardly know well, how to... Take nothing of it, Mr. Rasper. You're being here. Thanks enough for me. Mr. Carter, uh, that little boy coming along the line there, Jimmy, I think his name is, do you think I, I might give him... I mean, could I hand him his gift, do you think? Why, certainly. Riley. Oh, yeah. Mr. Rasper here wants to lend a hand. Can you use him? Hey, sure thing, Nick. Come along, Mr. Rasper. Uh, thank you, Mr. Carter. Well, listen, you just hand him these packages as they come along, Mr. Rasper, <laughs> and enjoy yourself, man. <laughs> I will. Uh, there, little girl. Uh, Merry Christmas. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Say, she... She liked it, didn't she? Well, they all appreciate a little kindness, Mr. Rasper. Now, now, here's a gift for that little boy there. Oh. Hello. Jimmy? Here you are. And a Merry Christmas, son. the day for you. Gosh, I haven't had so much fun since last year. Yeah, you played those games harder than any two kids in the bunch, Scubby. Yeah, and lost practically every time. <laughs> yeah, no well, you really have to be in condition to keep up with these kids. Boy, they're wonders. Hey, where do they get all that energy? That will be one of the world's great mysteries forever, Scubby. Nick, what are you thinking so hard about? Hmm? Oh, I was I was just thinking of the way Mr. Rasper took to the party. Huh? Hey, don't you mean the way the party took to Mr. Rasper, Nick? Yeah, mm-hmm. I never saw a man open up the way he did. Oh, it was wonderful. The children just flocked around him. And that's one of the greatest jobs that Nick Carter ever did. Well, what do you mean, Riley? Well, Patsy, you'll never believe it, but when Nick and I went to see Rasper to get a contribution to the party, he was the hardest case of unadulterated unpleasantness I ever saw. But somehow Nick managed to get under his skin and bring out, well, what she saw tonight. Well, for heaven's sake. How did you do it, Nick? Well, it wasn't difficult, Patsy. You see, I could see when we first spoke to Rasper that he was fighting something. But I didn't know what it was. But from what Riley, Scubby, and you told me, I found that three different times Christmas Eve had brought him bad luck. First, the fighter O'Day. Then Mrs. Rasper had left Rasper on a Christmas Eve, taking his son Jimmy with her. And third, he'd lost his promoter's connection at the arena, also on Christmas Eve. Well, the whole thing added up. Rasper associated Christmas Eve with a list of unfortunate incidents and fought anything that suggested the holidays to him. He made a lot of money, but it never brought him happiness. The big thing for me was to make him realize that people and Christmas meant good and not evil. And from what I saw this afternoon, the Rasper family and the whole neighborhood, for that matter, is going to benefit by his awakening to that realization. Oh, Nick, that's wonderful. You deserve a kiss for that. Oh, thanks, Betsy. I'm glad you feel that way, too. You know, I'm happier this evening because of Mr. Rasper than I would be if I'd solved 20 murders. He's made this a really merry Christmas for all of us. has been another of the strange adventures of Nick Carter, Master Detective, which are brought to you regularly at this time by WOR Mutual. What's your story going to be about next time, Nick? It's a little different from the usual story, because it started out with Nick himself being the victim of a holdup. Yes, and the men who held me up turned out to be innocent after all. Sounds a trifle complicated to me. It was complicated, but interesting. And it gave me plenty of trouble before I found the solution. Including a sore throat that almost finished Nick Carter. A sore throat? Why should that be dangerous? Because it was the kind that you get from a rope around your neck. Hey, wait a minute. You mean... All the rest of the story you get two weeks from tonight. Not now. So long, everybody. So long. So long, both of you. In the strange adventure you have just heard, Nick Carter was impersonated by Lon Clark, Patsy by Helen Choate, and Scubby by John Kane. The story was written for Nick Carter by Humphrey Davis. Original music was played by Lou White. The entire production was under the direction of Jock McGregor. Two weeks from tonight, at the same time, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter entitled Double Disguise. Or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Kidnapped Heiress. The 
this story is a copyrighted feature of Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. The Return of Nick Carter is produced in the studios of WOR and is broadcast over most of these stations Monday evenings at 9.30 Eastern Wartime. This is Mutual. It's another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Tonight's curious adventure, The Double Disguise. For Nick Carter and the mystery of the kidnapped heiress. Pardon me, but could you tell me which way to Bond Avenue, please? Bond Avenue? Why, yes. Uh, we'll just walk three blocks okay, straight Okay, It's a stick-up. What? Yeah. Hand it over and, uh, and be quick about it. Hand what over? Your wallet, of course. Come on. Oh, come now. Isn't it quite late in the evening for this sort of thing? There's nothing funny about this. I mean business. Now, you haven't been in the business very long, have you? That's enough talk. Just hand it over. Hand it over. I'll, I'll shoot. You really would shoot me, would you? Yes. This is your last chance. Please, I, I don't want to have to kill you. Okay. But you won't find very much. <laughs> All right, I'll take that toy pistol now. There. Oh. Oh. You knew all the while. Sure. Would have fooled most people, but you just happened to pick on the wrong man. I'm Nick Carter. Nick Carter? Gosh, I guess I did. My name is Brown. Chester Brown. Well, Mr. Brown, let's have it. What's the story? You're no gunman. Oh, you're right, Mr. Carter. I, I've never done this sort of thing before. Now, why'd you try to hold me up, then? Oh, I... I, I was desperate. I, I've been out of work for three months now. In times like these? Yes, I know, but I'm a salesman. There's no need for them now. Well, how about manual work? I tried that, but my heart isn't very strong. Oh, I see. Married? Yes, I was married six months ago. Where do you live? We live in a couple of rooms in a boarding house. Only a few blocks from here, Mr. Carter. Why do you ask? I'd like to go home with you and meet your wife. Oh, that means you aren't going to turn me over to the police. No, not yet at least. Oh, thanks. But one never knows, Mr. Brown. Let's go. Right this way, Mr. Carter. Stella? Oh, Stella? Stella? That's strange. She isn't home. Maybe she went out for a while. At this time of night? She'd be back by now. What does it mean? Well, it probably doesn't mean... Oh, wait a minute. Here's a note. Perhaps this will explain things. Here, let me have it. Dear Chet, I'll be gone for a few days. Don't worry about me. All our troubles will soon be over. We're coming into a fortune. I can't explain anymore now. You're Stella. Well, congratulations. Ah, look what's enclosed. Hmm, a hundred dollar bill. May I see it, please? Oh, here you are. Gosh, I can't believe it. It's too good to be true. Tell me, Mr. Brown, is your wife any rich relatives? Rich relatives? Never heard her speak of any. Mother and father no longer living. Well, she has uh, an uncle, a man by the name of James Spear. He lives somewhere out in Colorado. M maybe it's he. Yes, maybe. What are you doing, Mr. Carter? Just checking the number on this bill against the list I have here. But why? Ah, what is it? Mr. Brown, I'm afraid my congratulations were a bit premature. What do you mean? Have you read the evening paper? No, uh... I haven't seen a paper all day. Why? Michael Steelfield, the banker, was murdered last night. Ten thousand dollars were stolen from his private vault in one of the cleverest safe-cracking jobs seen here in years. Yeah, well, what's that got to do with this? The stolen money consisted of hundred-dollar bills. So what? The bill your wife left for you was one of those stolen by the murderer. Oh, but Mr. Carter, she, she had nothing to do with that. I feel sure of that, Mr. Brown. Well, then why should you want to... Suppose you went out tomorrow morning and tried to spend that bill. What would have happened? Why, I... 
Oh. Oh, I see. I'd have probably been arrested as a murderer. Exactly. But why did she leave that bill for me? Because she's as much a victim of this frame-up as you are. Brown, if my hunch is correct, someone's trying to make trouble for you and for her. Oh, but Mr. Carter, why, why, well, why should... Don't ask questions yet. Just listen to me. Pack up a bag and get out of here tonight. Go to 73 Bleaker Avenue. That's a rooming house run by friends of mine on the other side of town. Sit tight until you hear from me. Don't tell anyone where you are and don't use your right name. But suppose my wife comes back. I said to leave it all in my hands. Oh, but why? Now, don't I... be a fool. If you don't follow my directions, you may be dead before morning. <laughs> So you don't think either Brown or his wife had anything to do with the murder, Nick? No, Patsy, I don't. It's too obvious a frame-up. A frame-up? Yes, don't you see? The murderer persuades Mrs. Brown to go somewhere with him on some pretext or other and gives her one of the stolen bills to leave for her husband, who's sure to be arrested if he tries to spend it. But why should the murderer want to pin the job on Mr. Brown? That I don't know the answer to, Patsy. Except that for some reason or other, he wants to get Brown out of the way. Hello? Hello, Nick. I'm glad I found you in. Oh, Riley, what is it? You still say you're not interested in this Tillfield killing? Well, as a matter of fact, Riley, something's happened since you spoke to me about it. I've changed my mind. Oh, so you've heard already. Heard? What? About the big Postal Express robbery down on Front Street. That's where I'm calling from. I know, that's news to me. What do they get, Riley? $40,000 in negotiable bonds. Right out of the vault, Nick. Not bad. Yes, and this is the interesting part. Yeah? Do you know who those bonds will be in ship to? Michael Stillfield. Stillfield? Okay, Riley, thanks. I'll be right down. Well, Patsy, this thing gets more interesting by the minute. Let's go. Ah, here you are, Nick. Ah, hello, Patsy. Hello, Lieutenant. Well, Riley, let's have a look. Sure thing, Nick. Come on inside. Now, uh, this is Mr. Johnson, Nick. He's in charge of the express office. How do you do? So glad you came, Mr. Carter. Nothing like this has happened in the 30 years I've been with the company. Well, I suppose there's always a first time, Mr. Johnson. That's the vault over there, Mr. Carter. No, thanks. Hmm. Certainly don't come any finer. That's true, Mr. Carter. Absolutely burglar-proof. <laughs> or so we thought. Was anything else taken? No, just the bonds. And they're as good as cash, you know. When did you discover that they were missing? This morning. They were put in that vault last night. I watched the bookkeeper do it myself. I see. And you were the one who closed the vaults? That's right. I closed it and adjusted the time mechanism myself. Well, seems to be intact. That's just it, Mr. Carter. I can't understand it. Neither the vault lock nor the time attachment have been tampered with. It looks like the devil's own work. It's absolutely incredible, Mr. Carter. But there you have it. The safe was open and the bonds are gone. Well, what do you make of it, Nick? There aren't many men who could have pulled off this kind of a job. Oh, you're right there, Nick. As a matter of fact, I don't know anybody but Nick Carter could have done it. He's that handy with locks of all kinds. <laughs> <laughs> you have some idea, Mr. Carter? You say the bonds were put in the vault last night. Yes, that's right. About what time would you say? Well, we received them from the west on the five o'clock train. Hey, did you say from the west? Well, yes, they came from Colorado. And they were addressed to Michael Stillfield? That's right. And they were put in the vault a little after five. And as you already know, that's the last we were seen of them. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. I don't think we need bother you any further. I do hope you'll be able to track down that thief. It's more than a thief you've put me on the track of. The man we're looking for, Mr. Johnson, is a murderer. Hey, what was that stuff you were giving Johnson about looking for a murderer, Nick? That's exactly what I meant, Riley. You mean there's a connection between the murder of Michael Stillfield and this robbery, Nick? You catch on fast, Patsy. Uh, how do you figure it, Nick? Well, in both cases, it was Stillfield's property that was stolen. And in both cases, there was a remarkable safe-cracking job, right? Yeah, there's no doubt about it. Looks like it could be the same ones, all right. And you recall where Johnson said those bonds came from? Yes, from Colorado, Nick. Well, sure, I remember his saying that, but uh, what's that got to do with it? Just a hunch, Riley. 
But judging by the way these two safes are broken into, I think I know who probably did it. Uh, who? Clint Barto. Clint Barto? Oh, 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 you're having me believe in the, the dead come to life again, Nick. Why, don't you remember? He was reported dead five years ago up in Canada someplace. Yes, but where Clint Barto's concerned, I don't have much faith in that kind of a report. He's the most dangerous and resourceful criminal on the continent. Riley, I wouldn't be surprised that he had that report circulated purposely. Well, no, I, I hadn't thought of it that way. Furthermore, I suggest you make a thorough check on the background of Michael Stillfield, the murdered banker. An idea that may be some interesting facts turned up. Okay, Nick, it's as good as done. When you get the information... Well... What is it, Nick? We're being followed. Huh? Well, not for long we won't be, and I'll just let no, me... No, wait a minute, wait a minute. I want to handle this my own way, Riley. You continue on the way you're going. Pass uh-huh. you and I'll turn up this side street. Okay, Nick. Uh, I'll be seeing you. So long. So long, Riley. All right, let's you come along this way. Is he still following, Nick? Yeah. He's hanging on, all right. Uh-huh. Here. Into this doorway here. Okay. Now what? We'll just wait. He'll be along. Yeah, here he comes now. Stay here, Patsy. Be careful, Nick. Hey, you. What's the idea of following me? What? Who? Me? Yes, you. You've been tailing me ever since. Oh, no, you don't. Hey, let go of me. Uh, I ain't done nothing, mister. No? Not yet, you haven't. Now talk, my friend. And let's hear something interesting. Okay. I was tailing you. That's what I thought. What's your game? Oh, not my game. It was some bloke I met near the express office. Yes? What about this bloke? Well, he says there's a ten spot in it for me if I keep an eye on you all day. You know, see where you go and what you do. Well, then what? Well, that's all, mister. And I was supposed to report back tonight at eight with a dope and, and get paid. I see. Where were you supposed to report back? Beach Street, opposite the railway station. What did this man look like? Oh, you can't miss him, mister. He's about six foot six. Dark hair, and he has a long curved nose. Well, so he's the one. Oh, you know him, huh? Yes, I think I do. You were offered ten dollars, you say? Here's twenty. What for? For forgetting all about reporting back, see? Oh, I get it. Sure thing. Thanks. Wait a minute. Yeah? I want to get a good look at you. Huh? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, I shan't forget what you look like in a hurry. Now beat it, and remember, stay out of my way. Okay, mister. All right, Patsy, come on. What now, Nick? I'm going back to the office. I've got a special job to do now that requires a complete change of wardrobe. In fact, Patsy, a complete change of everything. There, that does it. Hand me that mirror, will you, Patsy? Mm Mm-hmm. Here you are, Nick. Hmm, not bad. Well, Patsy, do you think I look like the man who was following us? Simply perfect, Nick. I positively couldn't tell the two of you apart now. Now the voice. Okay, lady, thanks. Well, I guess I better blow it. The mob's waiting for me. (laughs) (laughs) Nick. Yes, what is it, Betsy? I'm afraid of what you may be letting yourself in for. Oh, now, don't worry. I'll be watching my step. You better. Make one false move with Bardo. Yes, Betsy. I know the kind of man I'm up against. Hello? Oh, yes, Riley. Oh, you did, huh? What'd you find? Mm-hmm. I see. Yeah, that's fine, Riley. Oh, no, no, no. I've got a plan of my own. Yeah, I'll do that. All right, Riley, thanks. Bye. What is it, Nick? I'd see my suspicions were right. The report came through on Michael Stalefield. He proves to be none other than James Spear. Spear? You mean Mrs. Brown's uncle? Right. Seems he made his money out west many years ago, then got into some difficulties there. Changed his name and came east. And he never got in touch with his niece? Apparently not. Well, then that fortune Mrs. Brown spoke about in her note is true. Yes. According to his will, she becomes sole heir to the entire estate, being his only surviving relative. Well, not bad. If she lives, Betsy. If she lives? Why shouldn't she live, Nick? Well, the person she left home with last night must be the same person who killed Stalefield. The hundred-dollar bill she left her husband proves that. And you think that... I think that if that person is Bartow, she's in very real danger. 
Steelfield owned a fortune and was killed. Now Mrs. Brown owns it, and she may very well be next on the list. Oh, I see what you mean. What time is it now, Patsy? Uh, 7.30. Okay, I better be off. I'm going to keep my 8 o'clock date. You will be careful, Nick. Yes, of course I will. You know what you're to do. Yes, I'll do just what you tell me. Good. Well, so long, Patsy. I'll be seeing you. I hope so, Nick. I hope so. <laughs> clock. And this is the corner, all right. But nobody seems to be sure. Wait. Uh Uh-oh. You waiting for someone, bud? Yeah. I was supposed to meet a guy here at eight. Okay, I guess you're the one. Follow me. Where are we going? I'm taking you to the boss. Where's that? He'll find out. Come on. Here we are. Just a minute. It's me, boss. Is this the guy, boss? Yeah. Come in. Close the door, Malone. Yeah. Well, what'd you find out? I followed the guy like you said. Well? How about that ten spot you promised? Don't worry, you'll get it. Now, what happened? Nothing. What do you mean? I tailed the guy to a house on Elm Street. They went in. I didn't see him come out all day. I see. Well, okay. You did a good job. Here's the ten. Anything else, mister? I could use more dough. And I ain't particular how I make it. If you get what I mean. Yeah, I get what you mean. You see, I figure you must have some kind of a racket, mister. Mm-hmm. Very clever reasoning on your part. Yeah. I'd sort of like to get in on it. That is, if you could use a guy like me. Maybe I could. You, uh, you don't happen to know the name of that man you were following, do you? Never seen him before. Well, it was Nick Carter. Nick Carter? Mm-hmm. Who's he? Never heard of him, eh? Well, he's just about the greatest detective this side of the Atlantic. Eh, yeah, this Carter must be quite a guy. Quite a guy is right. With quite a bag of tricks. He's the one man that stood between me and a fortune on three different occasions. Put you in the jug, eh? No, not quite. But on account of him, I've had to lay low the last five years. Now I've got another fortune within my grasp, and he's not going to stand in my way again. No, sir. I'll see to that. Yeah, wiped out a scheme, eh? Yeah. Beautiful one. Beautiful and simple. <laughs> he's going to be hoist by his own petard. <laughs> Come again? One of his own great tricks is going to be his undoing. I don't get you. All right, Nick Carter. You can come out from under that trick voice now. Keep him covered, Malone. Yeah, mate. Well, congratulations, Barrow. I was sure I had you fooled. It was a neat job, Carter. Your resemblance to Trigger is absolutely uncanny. Trigger? Yeah, one of my own men. It was all a frame and you fell for it. Knowing you and your tricks, I figure that's exactly what you do. And now that I'm here, what do you propose to do? Something I should have done a long time ago. This is the end of the road for you, Carter. <laughs> Bardo, I think you're bluffing. Oh, you do? Yes, I do. Why'd you have to go to all this trouble? You could have had one of your men shoot me in the street. No, Carter, I had a special reason for wanting to bring you here alive. Yeah? What's that? I wanted to see the look on your face when I opened the door to this inner room and you saw this. What? Chester Brown. Yeah. And I assure you he wouldn't be sleeping so peacefully if he knew what I was planning for him. And for you. Hey, you wake up. Wake up. You've got company. Yeah, you gave him too much of that dope, Malone. You might have killed him. So what, boss? Ain't that what you want? Yeah, but I want him to wait until Mr. Carter could keep him company. I want them to go out together. Come on, you. Wake up. What's all of... What's... You may not believe it, Brown, but this tough-looking thug is really our old friend, Nick Carter. Oh. Oh, so it's you, Mr. Carter. I thought I told you to hide away that address I gave you. <sighs> I did. These guys found out where I was. Did you tell anybody where you were? No. No, nobody. I just gave my address to my old landlady so, so she could forward my mail. Right, oh. boy. Isn't Nick Carter? Well, now that I've got you both here together, I'm going to hang you both together. Trigger. Yeah, boss? Come in here. 
Help Malone tie this great detective up while I keep him covered. It'll be a pleasure, boss. Hello there, detective. And thanks again for that 20. Don't mention it. You want this other guy too, boss? Yeah, I got him up in his feet. I want to watch them dance together. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, you. Come on up, sonny boy. Okay, boss. All set. Did you frisk him? Yeah, he's clean. Here's his gun. All right, then. Scott, what are they going to do? Looks as if they mean to hang us. No, 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 they can't, they can't do that. You can't. I, I haven't done that. Squeal <laughs> like a suck pig. Be like Carter. He isn't saying a word. I still don't believe you're going through with this, Bartle. No. Get Carter's rope over the rafter at this end. Put Brown's rope over the other end. No, no, no. Come on. Come on. There you are, boss. Good. Now a couple of chairs for him to stand up. See here, Bartle. You've nothing to gain by murdering us in cold blood this way. You've killed one man already. You've stolen $50,000. What more do you want? $50,000? <laughs> That's pin money. Still feels it's worth $5 million. What about it? That fortune's going to be mine, every cent of it. And you're the only man that might stop me, so I'm taking no chances. I know you're clever, Bardo, but I can't see how you're going to get your hands on Steelfield's money now that he's dead. On the contrary, Carter. That's what makes it all so simple. Because it makes Mrs. Brown his sole heir. And Mrs. Brown has been led to believe, by something that I said, that I'm a lawyer. And she's already turned over to me all the credentials necessary to claim her uncle's fortune. I'm sure my own wife will have no trouble at all convincing the real lawyers that she is Mrs. Brown. The real Mrs. Brown, poor woman, won't be with us very long, I'm afraid. Why, oh, you fiends, you devil, you have to you. Oh. So that's your devilish scheme, is it? Yes, and it's a scheme that I'm sure is going to pay off. I don't think so, Barrow. What do you mean? You really don't think I was foolish enough to come up here without taking certain precautions. Such as what? The police know exactly where I am. I'm afraid the laugh's on you, Barrow. Yeah. Look out of the window, Trigger. Okay. I don't see nothing. Hey, wait. Say, there is a cop across the street. What's he doing? Just stand there. Hey, maybe there's something to it, boss. Let's get this thing over with and beat it. Okay. Maybe what you said was so, Carter. It isn't going to help you much. Get them up in the chairs, boys. All right. Come on. Up you go. Come on. Up you go. Yeah, that's it. Are the ropes tied fast, Malone? Yeah, boss. Both of them are okay. Well, goodbye, Mr. Brown and Mr. Carter. No, 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 no you can't! Okay. Oh, the street. Kicks the chairs away, boys. Stop! Oh, you can't. Dance, Carter! Dance, dance! <laughs> All right, boys. Let's get back to the hideaway. <laughs> So that was his plan, Patsy. Yes, Lieutenant. I see. And if Nick didn't come out in a half an hour, we were to go in after him. The time's just about... Oh, look, Lieutenant. Oh, what is it, Patsy? Those three men leaving the building. They're getting into that car. Yeah, and in an awful hurry, too. Come on, Patsy, let's go in. Nick! Nick, where are you? Nick! Nick Carter, are you here? Try this door. No, he's not here. Try that one over there. He's not here. It's getting so dark. You're getting... Here I am. Hey, Patsy, listen. Here I am. Oh, Nick, are you all right? Oh, let me find the light here. Yeah. Oh, Nick, what's happened? What are you doing? I tried to hang us. Hang you? Oh, who was that with you, Nick? That's Brown. He nearly passed out. Oh. But I think he's going to pull through now. Oh, Nick, are you all right now? Right. Did they... Yeah, I'm... I'm okay. My throat's pretty sore, but I live long enough to see Barter and his men behind bars. Oh, take it easy, Nick. There's time enough for that. No, there isn't, Riley. Patsy... You stay here with Brown. Look out for him. Riley, where's your car? It's just on the block. Why? We haven't a second to lose. we got to follow Bardo. Huh? Every minute counts now. The woman's life's at stake. Oh, there's no sign of him yet, Nick. Oh, that's all right, Riley. Keep straight ahead on this road. Hey, do you have an extra gun in the car? Yeah. yeah you're, you'll find one under the seat there. Good. Oh, yes. Here it is. Well, how does your head feel, Nick? Oh, much better now. How did you ever get loose, Nick? They uh, they actually had you strung up, didn't they? They sure did. I can still feel it. Well, how did you do it? Well, after they tied my wrists, I got Bowder to talking and gave me time to work them loose. Oh, you mean you swelled your wrists when they tied them so that when you relaxed, they'd be so much smaller, huh? Mm-hmm. Except that having my hands free wouldn't have helped me much if Bowder and his men hadn't left right away. Fortunately, they saw you coming across the street, and they ran as soon as they strung us up. Well, what did you do then, Nick? By that time, I'd worked my hands loose. So I grabbed the rope above my head, 
pulled myself up. Whew, it was close. Yes, it was. And I cut the rope with a little trick knife that's built into my tie clasp. They never thought to look for one there. And I cut Brown down. Poor fellow, he was almost gone. You think heavens outsmarted them, Nick? This for Barto, that dirty, murdering, no good scoundrel. Oh, look, right. Huh? It's a car ahead of us. Oh, is that the right one, Nick? Let me see. There's so much dust on that. 3J20 R7. Is that last? Oh, six. Yes, that's the car. All right, now take it easy, Riley. I don't want him to get suspicious. Right. Yeah, they're turning up that dirt road there, Nick. Shall I follow him? Say, I know where that hideout is now. Oh, you do? Yes, must be the old Fairbanks Cave, not far from here. Bought used it before. You stop the car here. If Lux with us, this is the end of the trail. And the end of Bartow. Yeah, that's it over there, Riley. See it now? Yeah, we got him cornered like rats, Nick. All we have to do now is sit tight and wait for him to come out. No, that won't do. They've got Mrs. Brown in there. we got to get in before it's too late. Hey, Nick, there's someone coming out. It's Trigger. Come on, Riley. This is our chance. Quiet now. We'll creep up on him. I'm right with you, Nick. You'll get behind him. Oh! Ah, that was worth $20. Now for the boss himself. Well, boys, when are we going to get it over with? Right now, Malone. Did you take a look at her? Yeah, she's all tied up the way we left her. All right. Say, Trigger. Trigger. Yeah, boss, coming. What's up? That special little job on the lady inside. We're going to take care of that right now. Then what, boss? What do you mean, then what? Then we bury her, of course. And that's the end of Mrs. Brown. Then my wife takes over, claims the fortune, and we're all set for life. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was forgetting that you're going to palm the wife off as Mrs. Brown. You talk too much, Trigger. I prefer action. And so do I. Get your hands up, Clint uh, Bartow, and you too, my hey, own. Hey, what is this? Oh, that's, that's... Hoist is by hoist by his own petard, eh, Bartow? They caught her. They caught her. It can't be, boss. But it is. Now back up, both of you. And keep those hands up high. All right. Yeah, Nick. Come on in. Ah, oh, good work, Nick. Were you in time? Yes, Mrs. Brown's okay. She's inside there. Well, I guess we can call it a day, Nick. You saved the lives of the Browns, and we got Bartow and his gang where we can put him away forever. Yes, Riley, that's true. Huh. Clint Bartow and his tricks. Hoist by his own petard. Huh? W- what in the world does that expression mean, Nick? That? Oh, it's an old Hindu proverb, Riley. It means, man who make noose for other fellow, sometime find it around own neck. <laughs> This has been another of the strange adventures of Nick Carter, Master Detective, which are brought to you regularly at the same time by WOR Mutual. What's on the menu for next week, Nick? Imagine a murderer sitting in the death cell at State's Prison. It's just eight hours before he's scheduled to die in the electric chair. And then suddenly he sends for Nick Carter to prove he's innocent. Why did he wait so long before he sent for Nick? Well, that's all a part of the story, Joe. But I want to tell you that the next eight hours are about the busiest eight hours that Nick ever spent. And was he innocent? Ah, uh, that's also a part of next week's story. In other words, Mr. Ripley, we're just not telling anymore until next week. So I see. But I think when you've heard it, you'll agree that it's a story well worth hearing. So long. So long, folks. So long to both of you for another week. In the strange adventure you have just heard, Nick Carter was impersonated by Lon Clark, Patsy by Helen Choate. The story was written for Nick Carter by Ralph Berkey. Original music was played by Lou White. The entire production was under the direction of Jock McGregor. Next week, at the same time, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter entitled Nine Hours to Live. Or Nick Carter... And the mystery of the death house. This story is a copyrighted feature of Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. The return of Nick Carter is produced in the studios of WOR and is broadcast over most of these stations every Saturday evening at 7 o'clock Eastern Wartime. This is Mutual. Detective!
Yes, it's another case for that most famous of all manhunters. The detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Tonight's curious adventure... Nine Hours to Live. For Nick Carter and the Death House Mystery. And now, a late news bulletin. Nine hours from now, at the stroke of midnight... Johnny Waldron, the blonde-faced killer convicted of the murder of Mrs. Cornelius Fielding, will go to the chair. Just 30 minutes ago, the condemned man made a last request. But Johnny Waldron did not ask for a sumptuous last meal in the tradition of the condemned. Nor did he ask to see his nearest and dearest relative, his wife, Laura. No, Johnny Waldron's request was for something much more dramatic. He asked to see the great detective, Nick Carter. Now, just what this last-minute conference means is anybody's guess. Perhaps a reprieve for Waldron. Perhaps a clue as to what happened to the fielding jewels, which up to now have not even been found. At any rate, the master detective, Nick Carter, has consented to talk with Waldron and is probably at this very moment entering Death House Row. Keep tuned to this station for further dramatic developments. Where have you got him, Dad? He's in number one. We moved him to number one this morning. You see, it's a shorter ways to walk to the chair, number one. You all ready to go? Yeah, the barber was in and shaved his head and legs about an hour ago. How have you taken it? Oh, there ain't been a peep out of him. Don't want nothing to eat. Don't want a chaplain. Nothing at all. Only request he's made is to see you. <laughs> Funny time to ask to see a detective, huh? Now, if you don't mind my asking, Mr. Carter, what made a big shot like you decide to see him? Well, maybe I'm curious to know what's in his mind. Go off to you about a fellow who's going to die in a few hours. Oh, I don't believe that you got any sympathy for a criminal. Uh, not you. Not when a man's a killer. Well, here we are. Here's your company, Waldron. Oh, hi. Hello, Waldron. Oh, Mr. Carter. You got five minutes. All right, guys. Well, Johnny? Oh, so you did come. Gosh, I was afraid you wouldn't. Well, I must admit, I was surprised when the warden called me and said you wanted to see me. Yeah, I, I imagine you were. Gee, it was sure nice of you to come. Let's skip the formalities, Johnny. Time's too short for chit-chat. Come to the point. What's on your mind? Mr. Carter, you think I'm guilty, don't you? Well, didn't follow your case too closely. But you had a fair trial, and you were found guilty. Or did you have me believe? I'd like to have you believe that, that I'm innocent. Pretty late in the game to convince it, Johnny. Oh, I'm not looking for a last-minute reprieve. That isn't what I asked you to come out here for. When I got word a little while ago that the governor refused my last request for a reprieve, I... Oh, I just made up my mind that I'd only be kidding myself if I hoped any longer. Why did you want to see me, Johnny? Mr. Carter, I know I haven't got a chance. I'm... I'm going to be gone in, in just a few hours now. But I could go a lot easier if, if I thought that that maybe someday the world would know the truth. They'd know that, that Johnny Waldron was innocent. Johnny, if I thought you were innocent, I'd start the wheels turning right now to get your reprieve. Oh, wait. Let, let me finish, Mr. Carter. I know you don't believe me. Nobody does. I guess I couldn't expect you to believe me after the way things went at the trial. But sitting here in death row, waiting, the idea came to me that that maybe Nick Carter would show him someday. <laughs> of course, I'd be gone, but... Well, you see, there's there's Laura, my wife. She's going to keep on living, and and it'll be hard for her. I suppose she believes you're innocent. Oh, she, she's stuck by me swell. She's she's a wonderful woman, and I don't want the world to look on her as, as the widow of a murderer. Mr. Carter, all I'm asking is that, that after I'm gone... It, in your spare time, will you try to prove that they executed the wrong man? J just for my wife's sake. Johnny, if you're innocent, who do you think did rob the Fielding safe and kill Mrs. Fielding? I don't know, Mr. Carter. What? There's nobody you even suspect? Well, the only one that... that... No. No, I, I, I'm not going to accuse somebody I'm not sure of. I've only got a few more hours to live and I, I, I don't want... If you want me to do anything for you, Johnny, you better tell me everything you can about this. No. 
No, you'll find him for yourself once you start looking. <laughs> well, I've got to have some kind of evidence to go on it. I don't have any. Cards were stacked so well against me, but go see Laura. She's never stopped working for me. Maybe she knows more by now. Look here. If that's the case, why haven't you had a lawyer working for you right up to the last minute? Uh, lawyers. I never had that kind of dough. Oh, a couple of shysters came around thinking maybe I had the feeling Jules tucked away someplace. When they found out they weren't going to get a cut, they faded pretty fast. Even if you decide to do anything for me, Mr. Carter, I, I wouldn't be able to pay you for your trouble. You, you'd have to do it just, just as a favor to a dying man. You don't know where the jewels are? Why, no, Mr. Carter. How could I know? I didn't do that job. Look, you, you go see Laura. She'll tell you whatever she can. All right. Time's up, Mr. Carter. All right, Garrett. Well, Johnny, I'll look into your case. I I don't suppose you believe me. <laughs> I bet he's been telling you an innocent man is being sent to the chair, huh? He tells that to everybody. Did it ever occur to you, Garth, that he might be telling the truth? No. Why? Well, so long. No. Good luck. Oh, thanks for coming, Mr. Carter. And, and, and thanks for whatever you can do for me, sir. I'd very much like to know what happened to those fielding jewels. Huh? Oh, 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 yes. Well, maybe they'll turn up while you're investigating. Think so? I wonder. Say, guard, uh, how, how long is it until I... Eight hours, Johnny. Just eight hours more. Nick Carter's office. Oh, Patsy, this is Nick. Oh, Nick, thank heaven you called. This place is a madhouse. The office is filled with reporters. The newspaper and broadcasting companies have been telephoning. And the district attorney has been trying to reach you. And what's the trouble? They want to know if you're going to try to get a reprieve for Johnny Waldron. Hmm? The DA said he'd stick around his office all evening. And he's contacted the governor and he'll be on tap ready. Reprieve? Oh, great heaven, I just talked to the fellow. I don't have any evidence, none whatsoever. What's the matter with the DA? Well, when Nick Carter goes to work on a case, even at the zero hour, something usually pops. Well, tell him to hang on to the hats a while. And you, Patsy, go up to the courthouse and get a transcript in the Walden trial. Dig up what you can out of our files about Walden. I'm heading back from state's prison right away. Meet you in front of the office. All right, Nick. But we're going to have to work fast. They throw the switch in exactly seven hours and 40 minutes. <laughs> Waldron was really hired as a chauffeur. It was brought out of the trial that he ingratiated himself with the old lady every chance he got. Oh? You know, Mrs. Feeling was an invalid. Waldron used to carry her up and down stairs and waited on her and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. He was inside the house a great deal. Then, um, let's see now. Oh, the gun was traced to Mrs. Feeling's stepson, Tom Feeling. But the prints on the gun were Waldron's. Her stepson lived there with her? Yes, just the two of them. Mm -hmm. Walden and all the other servants slept out and reported for work in the mornings at 8. When was the body found? On a Thursday night at 10 o'clock, the library of the house. Tom Feeling came home from his club and found her. The safe was open and the jewels and money gone. Of course, any of the servants, as well as Tom Feeling, might have known the combination of the safe. Mrs. Feeling often opened it in front of all of them. The defense harked on that at the trial, but Waldron's prints on the gun and his alibi being so flimsy cooked his goose. I see. I see. How did Walden strike you, Nick? Guilty? It's the evidence that tells the tale in any case, Patsy. If we could find the party who has the missing fielding jewels... It would look pretty grim for that. Yes, it wouldn't look good, that's sure. Oh, Nick, look at the time. Ah, 5.50. In six hours and ten minutes, an innocent man may be electrocuted. Oh, no, Patsy. No innocent man will be electrocuted for a crime he didn't do, while my name's Nick Carter. And here's our first stop, Patsy. His old tenement house. Laura Waldron lives here. <laughs> You're very nice to come to see me, especially today. Mrs. Waldron, this is my assistant, Patsy Bourne. How do you do, Miss Bourne? Hello, Mrs. Waldron. Won't you two sit down? Here, let me dust the chair. Oh, no, no, don't. It's perfectly all right. Since Johnny's been away, I haven't been as good a housekeeper as I used to be. I'm no heart for it anymore. Mrs. Waldron, I came to see you because... I know you went to see my husband. I heard on the radio. Yes, that's right. 
Oh, but it's too late to get Johnny off, isn't it? Besides, we don't have any money to pay a famous detective. Mrs. Waldron, the only thing Nick Carter ever asks is that justice be done. Now, uh, Mrs. Waldron, tell me about Johnny. His habits, what he likes, what he doesn't like. Johnny's good, Mr. Carter. You see, I know he's innocent. But have you proof, Mrs. Waldron? Proof? No. Just my heart tells me he wouldn't kill anybody. But more than that, I know because he was with me at the time the police say she was killed. The prosecution tore his alibi to shreds. Yes, a wife's testimony doesn't count for much in court. Oh, yet how thankful I am that he was with me that night. But I know he's innocent. You understand what I mean, don't you, Miss Bourne? You understand when I say the world can stand against your man if you know he's right and good and true to you. <laughs> Mrs. Waldron, isn't there any way at all it can be proved that your husband was home with you that night? No. No. You don't think of providing alibis for staying in your own home. It isn't much, I know, but it's ours. Tom Fielding has offered to help me. Now Johnny's going to be... Tom Fielding? You mean the stepson of the woman your husband's convicted of murdering? Yes. In what way is he offered to help you? Money. He knows Johnny isn't a murderer. His testimony in court didn't follow that line, Mrs. Waldron. Of course not. Mr. Fielding had himself to protect. That's right, Nick. Feeling was under suspicion. Just this afternoon he called me again. And where's the jewels, I said to him. If my Johnny did it, where's the jewels and the money? Would I be begging for work if Johnny had done it? You're working now, Mrs. Walden? Day work. Scrubbing up places where they don't ask too many questions. Oh, but I'd mop the streets of this town from one end to the other every day. <laughs> Johnny didn't have to die. <laughs> oh, don't, Mrs. Waldron. <laughs> Don't cry, please. Please don't cry. You have to excuse me. Just that. I can't stand to think. I, I'm counting the minutes and seconds now. Only a few more hours. Johnny will be gone. <clears throat> Mrs. Waldron, I'd like to ask you another question. All right. Maybe Nick can save your husband yet, you know. Oh, if he only could. There isn't time left for me to chase down every witness and question them. <laughs> Tell me, Mrs. Walden, whom do you suspect of robbing and murdering your husband's late employer? Who? Oh. oh, Mr. Carter, I have no proof against anyone. I didn't ask if you knew who murdered Mrs. Fielding. I only said, whom do you suspect? But I have no right to suspect him. Right. What do you mean? Well, he's been so kind and offered to help. Tom Fielding. That's who you think did it. Oh, I never dared think it out loud before. <laughs> he was her stepson, you know, but she loved... Oh, they had their quarrels. Oh, they were just money spats. I'm not saying he did it, only... Only what? You talk to him, Mr. Carter. All right, I will. We'll go right over to the Feeling House now. Oh, but you won't find him at home at this hour, Miss Carter. He's always at the club at this time. I know from when Johnny used to drive for him. That's the old hunt club, isn't it? Yes. The tenth and fifth. Mm -hmm. Come on, Patsy. Let's hurry. Time's precious. Okay. Goodbye and thank you. I'll be right here waiting and praying you find the guilty man in time to save Johnny. <laughs> Nick, there's something puzzling you. What is it? Didn't you think Mrs. Walden's story made sense? Well, it did, and it didn't. But, Nick, doesn't it seem a bit odd for Tom Feeling to offer her money? Yes, if that's true. Well, then her story does make sense. Patsy, it's not what Mrs. Walden said that's bothering me. Something else. Something else? Well, what is it, Nick? I wish I knew. But there's something... Oh, there's a Something that doesn't fit into the picture. In the back of my mind somewhere, but I can't quite get the key to it. Well, if you ask me, Tom Fielding is the one who could straighten out a lot of things. And he's the man we're going to tackle right now. Well, 
This hunt club's pretty swanky, isn't it? <laughs> Good evening, sir. Can I park your car for you? Fancy place. Still has doorman and port. Oh, I beg your pardon, miss. Uh, ladies are permitted in the old hunt club. I'm sorry. Well, that lets you out, Patsy. <laughs> I guess it does. You better wait for me here. Yes, I guess I'll have to. Oh, Nick. Hmm? It's 8.15. Only three hours and 45 minutes to go until midnight. <laughs> Ring again, Nick. Fielding wasn't at his club, so he's got to be home here. Uh Uh-uh. Your womanly intuition isn't working right tonight, Betsy. Not a light in the whole house. I don't think anybody's home. Oh, Mr. Fielding, if you only knew how much time we've wasted looking for you. Well, Patsy, maybe we can uncover enough evidence without seeing Mr. Fielding face to face. What are you going to do? A little high-class lockpicking in the interest of Johnny Waldron and his wife, Laura. There we are. All right, come on in. Stay behind me. Gee, it's dark in here. Shut the door and I'll use my flash. Where are we headed for? The library. Oh. That's the room Mrs. Fielding was killed in, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Let's see. These old houses, the library is usually back this way, off the center hall. Come on. All right. You think there's anybody beside us in the house? I hope not. Ah, here we are. The door. This must be it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is the library. What are we looking for? All well, right, now I'm looking for Mrs. Fielding's safe. Safe? Mm hmm. Safe. Oh, oh, it, it's behind that portrait of her. That oh. was in the testimony. Yeah, you're right. Thanks, Betsy. Oh, turn on that small lamp, will you? Take a glance at the papers on the desk while I open this safe. Safe? Mrs. Fielding held her son and heir down while she was living. He's certainly making up for it now. Look at that wine cabinet. It's filled to the hilt with pre-war stuff. Oh, and look at this black market stuff. Have a gold tip cigarette, Miss Bowen. Yes, thank you. I will. That's a shame on you. How'd you feel if Tom Fielding walked in here right now and caught you swiping his expensive cigarettes? Only one, Nick. And for that matter, how would you feel if Mr. Fielding saw you about to open his safe? <laughs> You okay? Hey, yes, I, I guess so. They shot through that window there. The bullet went right in the side of the desk here. Well, we better get out of here, Nick. Now, one minute, Patsy. Got to see what's in this safe. It's almost open now. Well, who do you think shot at us, Mr. Fielding? Oh, Patsy, will you pick that bullet out of the desk? It'll be a handy piece of evidence. All right. So you're taking this attempt to murder us awful lightly, Nick. I don't think it was murder, Patsy. Not murder? No. You were standing by the wine cabinet not four feet from the window. And I was a perfect target standing here. No, Betsy, I think you'll find somebody was just trying to scare us away. Oh. Well, I got the bullet out. Looks like a thirty-two. Ah, there we are. Patsy. Yes? Look here. The missing jewels. Oh, Nick. Yes, right here in the safe. Oh, Nick, that's wonderful. Hey, Patsy, what are you doing? Oh, I'm getting the DA on the phone for you. You've got the evidence for Johnny Walden's reprieve. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. I know he wasn't guilty, Nick. Mrs. Walden was telling the truth. Patsy, put down that phone. Yes, Nick. Now, get me police headquarters first. I want a general alarm sent out for Tom Fielding. But Johnny Waldron... I still have two hours, Patsy. If Waldron's innocent, I'll prove it in time to save him from the chair. Nick, why should you want to talk to Mrs. Waldron again when you haven't asked for the reprieve? Only make her feel worse. There's something about her that doesn't add up, Betsy. And I've got to know what it is before I go any further. This is her door, isn't it? Mm Mm-hmm. Nick Carter, your thinking on this case is beyond me. Oh, Betsy, it's hard to explain. When I don't know myself what the missing link is, how can I explain it to you? But you found the jewels. Tom Feeling had them in his safe. Why, it's obvious, Nick. He didn't get along with his stepmother, and he... Nick, what are you doing? Going to open Mrs. Walden's door? Oh, no, don't do that, Nick. I'm sure she's here. She's she's probably been crying and doesn't want to see anybody. Let me call her first. Mrs. Walden? Mrs. Walden? 
Oh, sorry, Patsy. We haven't any time to waste. Now, let's see. Where's the light switch? It's here by the door. Oh, she isn't here. So it seems. Nick. Hmm? Look here. There's a gold-tipped cigarette in this ashtray, the same kind we saw at Fielding's house. Let's have it. Hmm, no lipstick on it. Kind of pinched in here at the end. He's been here. I never would have believed it of him. Believe what? What well, that a man like Feeling would come to a place like this. Why, a man like that wouldn't get his hands dirty putting them on the doorknob of a hovel like this. Say that again, Patsy. What? Well, a man like Feeling wouldn't dirty his hands on the doorknob of a place like this. I got it. Patsy, you just gave me the key I've been looking for. Come on. We've got to get back to Feeling's library or there'll be another murder. <laughs> You know, Patsy, there are times when having a siren on this car comes in handy. And tonight's one of them. Hope we're in time. Do you think the police have picked Fielding up yet, or do you think he'll be at his home? He's at home. I'll bet my bottom dollar on that. Nick, do you know what time it is? Stop worrying about the time and come on. I'm right with you. The place is still dark. There's a little light shining in the hallway. He's here, all right. Why don't you step, Patsy? Don't worry about me. I slipped the latch in the front door when we left. Let's see if it's been bolted. No, still open. All right, come on. Where do you think he is? The library, probably. Oh, I hear someone, Nick. Yeah, they're both here. Oh, that's Mrs. Walton's voice. Open the door, Nick. No, it's locked. We'll try to pick it. Help! Oh, Nick, hurry. I am hurrying. Stay away from me! Help! Help! Oh, he killed her. There. Oh, Mrs. Walton. Oh, thank heaven you came. He was just going to shoot me. I got the gun away from him. And, oh, oh, you I, shot him. Yes, Mr. Gordon. But it was self-defense. Anyone can see that. Oh, I'm so sorry for you, Mrs. Walker. It was worth it. It was worth it. Now Johnny will be safe. He won't have to die in the chair. Nick, you've only got seven minutes to call it. Seven minutes to twelve. Hurry, Mr. Gordon. Just a minute. Calm yourself, Mrs. Walton. Here, have a cigarette. A cigarette? All right. May I light it for you? Thanks. Wait a minute till I get my cigarette holder out of my bag. So, you do use a cigarette holder. I thought so. Nick, the time is getting awfully short for your call to the DA. I'm not going to make that call. Why, Nick, not going to make it. No, Mrs. Weldon. It was a nice frame-up you and your husband tried against Tom Fielding, but it didn't work. Frame-up? Yes, frame-up. You and Johnny staged this whole thing to get him a last-minute reprieve. It was pretty clever, but you made a couple of mistakes. For example, this gold-tipped cigarette butt I found in your apartment tonight. What about it? When I found this butt in your apartment, all pinched in at the end from having been smoked in a holder, I knew you'd lied about not having seen Tom Fielding. These particular cigarettes are made to order for him. I didn't leave it there. I couldn't be sure of that until I found that you used a cigarette holder. Then I knew I was right. You did leave it here. Go on, prove it. Another thing. Patsy. Hmm? Take a look at Mrs. Walden's hands. My hands? Why, they're beautiful. Beautifully manicured. Exactly. Mrs. Walden, with hands like yours, you don't scrubs for a living. That dingy apartment of yours is merely a front. Look out, Nick. A gun. Huh? Yes, and I know how to use this gun, too, and I'm going to. Uh, oh! So sorry to hit you, Mrs. Walden. Patsy. Yes? Take a look at Tom Fielding. See if he's still alive. Right, Nick. You haven't got anything on me. You can't get he's me still for breathing, anything. Nick. Good. Go on for an ambulance, quick. Okay. Oh, but Nick, can you prove this charge against Mrs. Walden? Can you be positive she and her husband framed Fielding? Not yet, Patsy, but I'm so sure I'm right that I'll risk my reputation on it. But Nick, as long as there's the slightest doubt about it, shouldn't you call the DA and give Johnny Walden the benefit of the doubt? No, Patsy. As far as I'm concerned, there's no doubt whatsoever. I'm so sure I'll even risk Johnny's life on it. Nick Carter's office. Oh, yes, Lieutenant. Yes. Yes. It was. He is. Well, I see. Well, thank you, Lieutenant. Yes, I'll tell Nick. Goodbye. Was that the report from police headquarters, Spencer? Yes, it was Lieutenant Riley. And you were right, Nick. That gun you took from Mrs. Walden was registered in Johnny's name. And she lied about taking the gun away from Fielding and shooting him in self-defense. Fielding's fingerprints weren't on the gun anywhere, but hers were all over it. Did they check with the bullet when you picked out of that desk? The one that was fired at us? Yes, and it came from the same gun. Fine. And what about Fielding? Did Riley say? He's going to live. What's more, he regained consciousness long enough to make a statement. Good. Oh, Nick, that Mrs. Walden was certainly clever. She was planning the jewels in Fielding's safe when he came in the room and caught her. So she... She held him at the point of her gun, 
and knocked him out, bound his wrists and ankles, gagged him, and hid him away in another room. What? How did you know that? Very simple, Betsy. The marks where he'd been tied were still on his wrists when I examined him, and also there was a bump on his head. Nick, you're always holding out on me. And one other thing. What made you think Fielding's life would be in danger way back when we were in Mrs. Walden's apartment the second time? Sure, sir. Well, Patsy, after your inspired remark about hands, I suddenly realized what it was about Mrs. Walden that puzzled me. It was her hands. I knew that with hands like hers, she couldn't be earning her living scrubbing floors. Oh, I see. And if she were lying about that, it was very probable she was lying about everything. And the whole thing was a plot to make Fielding look guilty. But why should that make you suddenly afraid that something might be going to happen to Fielding? Patsy, if she and Johnny were so anxious to get Johnny a reprieve that they were willing to give up the jewels to make it look as if Fielding were really the guilty man, it was entirely possible that she might go further and kill Fielding and try to make it look as if he killed himself. But how would that help Johnny Waldron? Well, if it was done right... It would look as if he were remorseful at having let Johnny take the blame. And she almost got away with it. But she didn't, because Nick arrived in the nick of time. You're a wonderful detective, Mr. Carter. And so, ladies and gentlemen, at midnight last night, Johnny Waldron went to the electric chair to pay for the crime of having murdered Mrs. Cornelius Fielding. His dramatic last-minute attempt to get a reprieve failed, thanks to the quick action of that master detective, Nick Carter. In those few short hours that Carter was actually on the case, he found the missing jewels, uncovered a well-laid plot between Johnny and his wife to pin the murder on Tom Fielding and save Fielding's life. Tom Fielding and the entire community owe a debt of gratitude to Nick Carter. This has been another of the strange adventures of Nick Carter, Master Detective, which are brought to you regularly at this time by WOR Mutual. Well, Nick, what happens in your next week's story? I want to tell you the story of the time that I quite accidentally stumbled onto a terrible crime. Or to be more correct, I stumbled onto evidence that a terrible crime had been committed. That doesn't sound like a very unusual thing for you to do. Except for one little fact, Mr. Ripley. We didn't know where or when the crime had been committed. In spite of the fact that we heard the story of the murder from the victim's own lips. As a matter of fact, we even heard the murder committed. And we were powerless to do anything about it. If you're trying to make me curious about it... We are. You're certainly succeeding. Well, it's as unusual a tale as I've had the pleasure of telling in a long while, I assure you. So, until next week, so long. So long, folks. And so long to you, Nick and Patsy. In the strange adventure you have just heard, Nick Carter was impersonated by Lon Clark. Patsy by Helen Choate. The story was written for Nick Carter by Barth Conray. Original music was played by Lou White. The entire production was under the direction of Jock McGregor. Next week, at the same time, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter entitled... Records of Death. Or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Unclaimed Box. This story is a copyrighted feature of Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. The return of Nick Carter is produced in the studios of WOR and is broadcast over most of these stations every Saturday evening at 7 o'clock Eastern Wartime. And don't forget that the adventures of Nick's adopted son, Chick Carter, are broadcast over most of these stations Mondays through Fridays at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Wartime. This is Mutual. Hey, well, I hope you really enjoyed this compilation. I enjoyed it, and I enjoyed putting it together for you. Now, of course, this is the part of the show where I become the radio announcer and talk to you about the Johnny Dollar Club. (laughs) What's that, you say? You don't know what the Johnny Dollar Club is? Well, Hearth and Home Entertainment is no longer monetized by YouTube. That's nothing we've done wrong. This was just their decision. (laughs) Believe me, they didn't ask me. (laughs) So we're no longer a part of the YouTube partner program, but that's okay because we have the Hearth and Home Entertainment partner program. (laughs) That's right. Starting at only a dollar a month, you can help keep Hearth and Home Entertainment on the air. You need your support because it does take time and money to put together these shows and to run a channel like this. So if you would, take a minute, 
Click in the links below. You can go through either Patreon or buy me a coffee and see what level of support works for you. Now, all levels of support, even the dollar level, get access to exclusive content. So it's a win-win situation. You get to support the channel and you also get access to some great exclusive content. Another way you can support the channel, if you have a business and you'd like to sponsor a video, contact me through the channel's email and you'll find that on the about section of our channel page. The channel gets about a quarter of a million views a month and we have a global outreach. So it's a very affordable way to advertise your business. So reach out through an email and let's see what we can do. Well, thanks so much for tuning in. 